Hello everyone and welcome to the Dry Dock episode 241. It's the Patreon Dry Dock, so strap in, you know what's got coming up. At least five hours, possibly more, of questions. So, starting with the first one. Phil Kreider asks, were submarines strictly diesel electric or what, did they have a direct drive option for the diesels on the surface? It varied. There were actually submarines with what you might call a direct drive, i.e. you could hook the diesel motors directly to the propeller shaft to drive the submarine without any interference from the electric systems. And there were indirect drive systems where the, mo mo di the diesel motors would drive generators which would provide current to the motors as well as obviously providing current to recharge the batteries. Where you had the direct drive, obviously you needed a method to switch out from electric propulsion to diesel propulsion, as well as a way of diverting the diesel power off to drive uh, some kind of generator, which would then charge the batteries as well. So, unfortunately, <laughs> in the bigger submarine using navies, it's actually impossible to say, well, this particular submarine fleet used this method this submarine fleet used this other method because both methods were present although it was going oddly enough in opposite directions in that the older u.s subs had the ability to directly drive from their diesel motors the later u.s subs used the indirect system so the diesels were always powering generators rather than being directly connected to the prop shafts whereas the germans had indirect drive in some of their older u-boats and then they had the direct drive option in their newer u-boats um, and japanese italian british subs etc you generally will see something similar although the exact proportions and ages of which subs have direct and indirect drive systems can vary um, down to almost nothing because remember, there's also a bunch of imported submarines present, especially amongst the older elements of the submarine fleet. Perhaps those would only be used in training by World War II. Generally speaking, it is held that the indirect drive system is a bit more flexible, a bit more resistant to battle damage, but it has the disadvantage of requiring a slightly more complex interface. Uh, it uses a lot more copper wiring, for example, Whereas, which might sound a bit silly when it comes to you know saying it's more resistant to battle damage, but the fact is that with the indirect system, you usually have multiple generators driving a single motor. So if you lose one, then you can still drive the motor and, and or charge the batteries to some extent. Plus, of course, you don't have as many issues with having to worry about prop shafts buckling along the length of the sub because the prop shafts are just connected to the electric motors, which can be right aft. Um, but, as I said, because it uses a lot of valuable resources like copper, this appears to be why the Germans switched to direct drive during their wartime production, because switching between direct diesel and direct electric drive is very quick, um, but it means you don't have to use anywhere near as much copper wiring, because you just need the motors, the batteries, and the diesels, as opposed to the large-scale interfacing that you need to get to transmit all of the diesel's power via to the electric motors plus of course if you want to use your indirect drive system your electric motors have to be large enough and therefore involve a lot more copper to actually power the sub as it moves through the water at top speed alec ruby asks with regards to superchargers did they use them only for long range fire or would there be a precedent where you could fire them at close range for increased penetration uh, would supplying other battleships that didn't receive the increased elevation modification or built with superchargers be a good idea or not? For example, would King George V have been better able to penetrate Bismarck's armour and put the ship down faster? And did the ships that didn't receive the modifications, was this due to economic factors or something else? So the latter one, the ships that didn't receive the elevation modifications and hence had to be issued with superchargers, that was because the elevation modifications were done during renowned war spike Queen Elizabeth Valiant's modernizations. So essentially the ships that didn't receive modernizations, partly that was economic factors, how much could be afforded to be done at any given stage, partly also the availability of shipyards. But essentially because they hadn't been modernized, this was a stopgap solution 
uh, because taking off the guns and the turrets to modernise them to allow an increase in elevation from 20 degrees to 30 degrees was quite an extensive and complex and costly process. Uh, as far as did ships use them just for long-range fire or could you have used them at close range to increase penetration? In theory, there'd be nothing to stop you using them at closer range as well because, yep, yeah, increase the velocity of the shell and therefore also reducing the angle of fall so it's more perpendicular when it hits belt armor that would increase the penetration values however it seems that the ships that were issued with them so the revenge class um, malaya barham and repulse they don't seem to have actually used them in combat mostly because a lot of them never got into a position where they actually needed to use them. Most of the older QEs and the Rs rarely, if ever, actually shot their guns in anger at a battleship opponent. Now, you could probably argue that um, the R-Class and Malaya, which were present at Calabria following up Warspite, they probably could actually have made use of the superchargers because otherwise they were out of range but they appear to have fallen into the trap of thinking that the shell splashes from Warspite were their shell splashes, and so it didn't register to them that their shells were falling short. Um, so as a result, we don't know exactly what real-life combat effects those superchargers would have had in a battleship versus battleship engagement, but your idea is sound. Um, the superchargers were used in shore-based 14 and 15-inch guns, but that's a slightly different matter, obviously. Um, and would supplying other battleships that didn't need the increased modifica elevation modifications, supplying them with superchargers, would that have been a good idea? Uh, it depends on the ship, because obviously the uh, battleship's guns are designed for a specific amount of recoil, and the superchargers containing considerably more explosive would increase that recoil and that could cause problems which is one of the reasons why the superchargers weren't issued to these ships with the 30 degree increased elevation and newer shells because they could reach out as far as was considered necessary and further modification of the guns to allow them to take the recoil without slamming into things if they use superchargers was considered a step too far vanguard as far as we know is the only ship which had both a 30 degree elevation and the modifications to the gun mountings to allow it to use superchargers obviously though vanguard was commissioned post-war and so she never saw action and so for barrel wear reasons etc they never saw fit to actually test that although we have it on good authority that she could have used those if necessary uh, and similarly with things like king george v or rodney Yes, in theory, the guns probably could have taken some version of a supercharge, but without their gun mounts, you know, set to be able to actually absorb the recoil, it wouldn't necessarily have been the wisest option. <laughs> of course, at low elevations, when the guns are not recoiling into the gun pits, they're just recoiling into the turrets, that's a slightly different issue, which is why you could issue the supercharges to the ships with lower amounts of elevation, but... Yeah, it would have been a, a marginal improvement, and let's face it, they wrecked Bismarck pretty hard anyway. Nathapron Hongsheron asks, Did the King George V's quad turret really have more problems than its twin counterpart? If so, what made a quad turret different from, the two, from having two twin turrets side by side? It's a combination of things. Um, I've mentioned some of the very, very tight tolerances on the King George V's fire... Uh, turrets and um, shell handling systems previously but you've also got the fact that as you can see here the quad turret is just so much larger than the twin and when you've got an object that large which is relatively rigid thanks to the barbette then any kind of flex that occurs which you know will happen as the hull flexes in the water which may cause issues is going to be magnified quite significantly compared to with a twin turret because it's got much more distance to travel over so you know for let's say if everything twists out of alignment by half a degree which is you know a little bit silly but let's go with it but by half a degree in a twin turret that half a degree might only have 
15-20 feet to propagate over so the overall deflection will be smaller whereas if the pro if it has 35-40 feet to propagate over then that deflection is going to be much larger by the end of it and apart from various issues like that the other thing is just simply statistical odds um, probability and statistics can be difficult for some people to get their head around but if you have let's say something that is 99% reliable so let's say the um, hoists and gun system for the 14 inch gun as used in the King Charles V is 99% reliable if you have four of them side by side and they're all operating together that doesn't mean it's still 99% reliable it, you know, I've had a lot of people over the years, even some people who really should know better in some of my day jobs come up and tell me, no, 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 this system is 99% reliable or whatever figure. And therefore, you know, if we have 20 of them all doing the same job, then it should all still be 99%. You know, you just, you just take the lowest one, surely. That, that isn't how probability and statistics work. What you do is you take the probability as an expression of a fraction of 1, so in the case of 99%, that would be 0.99, and you multiply it by how many of those instances you actually have to worry about. And obviously, if it's completely standalone, then you might have an argument of saying it's 99%, but they're not standalone. They're all operating together in a single operating environment, i.e. a quad turret. Um, or a twin turret. So if you have two systems operating together and they both have a 99% reliability rating, then you do 0.99 multiplied by 0.99 and you actually get 0.98. So a, if, you, if you have a twin turret using a 99% reliable gun system with two guns, that is actually now a 98% reliable system. And then if you multiply that four times for the quad turret, so 0.99 multiplied by 0.99 multiplied by 0.99, etc., then it actually goes down to a 96% reliable turret. And now you you know a 4% failure rate is considerably higher than a 2% failure rate. In fact, it's twice as high. And that's with a 99% chance of something going right and only a one percent chance of it going wrong things get a lot more messy the further you go so for example if you had a system that was 95 percent reliable as an individual unit then the twin turret would be nine just over 90 percent reliable whereas a quad system would be 81 and a half percent reliable and all of a sudden you can start to see that's quite a drop in reliability and therefore you know with your 95% reliable system now you're looking at a failure somewhere in the system one in every 10 salvos whereas with your quad system you're now looking at about one in every five salvos having something go wrong so part of it is literally just odds mark rice asks who do you think had the better armored cruisers in world war one britain or germany well, first of all, we're going to have to exclude the battle cruisers because, technically speaking, otherwise we'd be basically arguing the merits of Blucher versus Invincible because both were described as armoured cruisers when they were initially built. And then you've got, well, okay, but also then Invincible is also described as a battle cruiser. So do we include the German battle cruisers and all that nonsense? So we're going to draw the line at the Scharnhorst class and the Minotaur class, respectively. Now, when it comes to the regular armoured cruisers, it is a little bit complicated by one big factor, which is that in the time period that the armoured cruiser is really in vogue, the Germans don't build that many. The British do. Um, so there's whole strings of classes of British armoured cruiser that basically have no German equivalent. But broadly speaking, as much as armoured cruisers have much utility in World War One at all, I think you're going to find that actually the British armoured cruisers are generally better because they, apart from the Monmouths, rather consistently have a maximum belt thickness of six inches. Obviously, they're all operating on the distributed armour scheme, so it's not consistent across the board. Um, they also generally have similar or better turret protection than their German counterparts, and they're almost entirely for either similar speed or faster depending on the exact class and who, what you're comparing 
which two, because as I said, there are multiple British classes you can compare to single German classes. So broadly speaking, the British ships have a slight speed advantage, possibly even a significant speed advantage, again, depending on the ship. They actually have better armour protection, which might come as a surprise to some people. And firepower-wise, it varies quite a lot. So if you look at something that's, say, constructed in 1898, so you'd be looking at the Prince Heinrich versus the Cressy class, well, at that point, they're both following two large single guns, a 9.4-inch for the Germans and 9.2-inch for the British. And then in the secondary battery, the British ship has more six inch guns 12 of them versus the 10 5.9 inch um although neither side's likely to be able to make much use of them but <laughs> all of all of their secondaries in a high sea environment but then you get the drakes for the british which continue with the pair of 9.2s um the devonshires which go for four single 7.5s and when you look at the germans looking at that same uh, same kind of time period the Devonshire's being laid down in 1902. So if you go forward in time for the Germans, go to the Runes, which are also laid down in 1902, they've now got four 8.3-inch guns. So they have a slightly heavy... Well, they have a double the heavy firepower, um, even though it's an 8.3 versus a 9.2. But they have 10 6-inch guns, which is similar to uh, the British equivalent. So if you look at a Devonshire... Um, well, the Devonshire is a little bit misleading because it's got the four 7.5s, but you'd say, broadly speaking, in the mid, mid period, they go from having the same armament to the German ships arguably having a heavy, slightly heavier armament, although, as I said, lighter armour and a bit slower. But then you get the next year the Duke of Edinburgh's, which show up with six 9.2 inch, as well as 10 6 inch, which means they now have two additional heavy guns compared to a rune and a similar number on the secondary battery. And then you have the final German armoured cruiser set, which is the Scharnhorsts, which of course have eight of their 8.3 inch guns, a relatively small secondary battery, and finally bring the armour up to six inches and 22.7 knots. And then you look at the final two British armoured cruiser classes, so you've got the Warriors, which have six 9.2 inch guns, and but they also have four 7.5s, and then small anti-torpedo boat guns similar armor and the british ships are slightly faster and then you have the minotaurs which also have four 9.2s although in a better laid out configuration two twin turrets um instead of the previous six which are in single turrets so actually the broadside is the same four guns for the 9.2s but then they have 10 7.5s as opposed to the six inch which are on the shan horse so you could argue for the final class although the germans have brought their armor up to the same spec there's roughly the same thickness and their speed is near enough the same as the 23 knots of the minotaurs the minotaurs have a heavier gun battery for longer range combat overall so as I said, it varies quite a bit and also depends on what exactly you value about an armoured cruiser. But on balance, if you took the armoured cruisers as a whole produced by Britain and Germany, I'd say the British probably did slightly better. Michael Griffith asks, It seems to me that anti-aircraft fire has been portrayed as much more effective in recent writing. Is this a perception error or is it actually happening? I think it possibly marks a shift in in terms of what people are looking at when it comes to anti-aircraft fire. Because if you are, say, writing a book where you're looking at how many aircraft were actually shot down in a specific engagement versus how much anti-aircraft ammunition was expended to do so and did it achieve its overall result in sort of an immediate gut feeling then I can see how some earlier works would say that maybe anti-aircraft fire wasn't quite that effective because, you know, even in the period when VT fuses were actually introduced, and certainly a significant for much more so before then, when you look at the actual results, you really need to expend a colossal amount of ammunition to shoot down an aircraft. And obviously the enemy doesn't usually show up with just one aircraft. So in order to break up and or shoot down most or all of an attacking in aircraft wave, there's going to be massive resources expended. 
And of course, if a handful of those aircraft slip through and actually score hits, then it's going to look like actually the anti-aircraft fire probably wasn't all that effective. And you start looking at things like uh, combat air patrol interceptions and other things. Conversely, perhaps with access to more art, modern archives and a little bit more modern scholarship, being able to review more data, and it starts to become clear just what the long-term effects of the anti-aircraft fire were, not just you know how much ammunition did you need to spend to shoot down a single aircraft. That kind of uh, information was available pretty quickly. But over the longer period, we've become more and more aware, I think, of you know the destruction of enemy pilots which has then hampers the your opponent's ability to put skilled pilots back up in the air which means future air attacks become less and less successful and less and less effective um, plus the strain it puts on the aircraft industry having to replace those aircraft the strain on the pilot academies of having to rush training to get new pilots out there the fact that it will lead to temporary temporary lulls in availability so, you know, if you wipe out the air group of an aircraft carrier, yes, they may replenish, regardless of whether it's British, American or Japanese, they may be able to go back and replenish those aircraft and get some new pilots at, in some amount of time, whether that be days, weeks or months. So you might think, oh, oh well, you know, it's not really so much of a problem. But then you also end up having to think about well, what could that carrier have done the next day or the day after that or the day after that if it hadn't had its air group wiped out on a, in a specific engagement or mostly wiped out? So I think these kind of measures coming in has, have perhaps led to the, the anti-aircraft fire effect being considered a bit more effective than it was in, in previous times. Although I must say there is also perhaps a trend at some times to overstate these days just how effective anti-aircraft fire was because well for one thing as you find out with all sorts of engagements it only takes one or two aircraft to get through and for a second thing there can sometimes be a little bit of a divergence too far away from looking at resources expended because you know yes you might have stopped that two dozen aircraft attack wave cold with your anti-aircraft fire but how many hundreds of thousands of tons of shipping did you need to do that relative? You know, what was the cost of the fleet and its anti-aircraft battery that you needed to stop that attack relative to the cost of those aircraft? Now, obviously, you can do other things with that fleet, but it can lead to issues similar to what I've pointed out previously when it comes to things like people saying, oh, yes, well, Operation Tango proved that the aircraft carrier had complete dominance over the battleship. And I look at it and go... I mean, technically, but also no, because if you add together the tonnage of the aircraft carriers that sent their aircraft after Yamato, and you replace that with the similar tonnage in battleships, that amount of battleships would have put Yamato down pretty quickly, I think. In fact, the, the similar tonnage in battleships probably would have put, arguably, put Yamato down faster than the air attacks did. So it's not necessarily fair. Um, perhaps it'd be fairer to look at Operation Tango if you're only restricted to using two Essex class or an Essex and a, and Enterprise. You know, can those two carriers' air groups put down Yamato before Yamato completes its mission objectives? That would be a fairer analysis. Bef I mean, that's before you get into you know the fact that the carriers can reach out and hit Yamato far beyond where Yamato can hit it, and so on and so forth. But you do have to, you know stop the pendulum going too far the other way i think texas and la shock asks what is the most modern aircraft to operate from the deck of a world war ii era carrier i think it depends on your definition of what a world war ii era carrier is if by that you mean a aircraft carrier that actually served in world war ii then we're going well into the cold war period so my knowledge and memory might not be quite as exact as it is for early periods but i think in that case it would probably be an a6 intruder operating off of an essex class because i think the a6 is a slightly newer aircraft than an f4 phantom and uh, the other aircraft of that era um and 
if by World War II era carrier you mean a carrier whose design and construction originates in World War II, but doesn't strictly have to have served in World War II, because that opens things up to things like the Audaciouses, the Midways, and the Centaurs, in which case it's going to be a coin toss between either FA-18 Hornets on Midway, if you want to go by absolute first flight, or Sea Harriers operating off of Hermes, if you want to go by subtype first flight. Because I think, again, this is me, I think, the Harrier flew before the FA-18, but the Sea Harrier flew after the FA-18. So, you know, take your pick from those. The Almighty Hypnotoad asks, I was looking at strange and unconventional ship designs of the late Victorian era a while back and came across the inventions of Frederick Knapp of Canada and Ernest Bazin of France, the roller ship. How did these designs work? Could they have been in any use in merchant service? And could they have been converted into military service? So the theory behind them, I mean, Knapp and Bazin's designs are quite different. Um, Knapp's designs basically is... But what if a boat was a cylinder and the long edge of the cylinder actually faced forwards and it just kind of rolled its way across the Atlantic with everything inside on roller bearings so you didn't go end over end like you're in a giant dishwasher? Bazan's design, as you can see, relies on effectively suspending the ship on a giant platform supported in the water by these massive great wheels and then the wheels themselves would rotate to provide propulsion and you could also lower a screw down to provide additional propulsion. Um, the, the idea, at least of Bazan's, was that by minimising the actual surface area and volume that's in the water, because as you can see the bulk of the ship is now above the water, um, and by that rotating and therefore pulling the water along rather than just being just resisting, uh, forward motion that you could have a faster and more efficient drive system and naps for all the boats pretty much the, the same idea just working slightly differently um, you know what if your what if your hull was also your propulsion system kind of thing um, now they didn't work basically in theory it's a good idea however the problem is that for the kind of surfaces you end up generating to dig into the water, a lot of water ends up being bound to the surface of the propulsion unit, the hull, um, as it exits the water. And this then gets carried up out of the water. And of course, the drive system is now having to fight the gravity, the fight gravity, which is trying to pull all the attached water down. And this radically slows everything down. And makes the whole system much less efficient than it would otherwise appear to be on paper. Apparently, there were some ideas to fix this. Um, I mean, one relatively simple one that I can think of would be maybe to put some kind of scraper unit um, a couple of feet above the waterline, attached perhaps to the central bearing, which would forcibly detach a bunch of the water, but the amount of force that would be required you know, I, I'm not sure quite how effective that would be versus the additional weight, etc., etc., and also what the forces involved with projecting a bunch of water moving at speed back down into the path of water that was being used as the, you know, moving at speed to propel the ship. But in essence, physics got in the way. And the same with Knapp's roller boat. Again, the water basically just stayed attached to it for too long once it got out once the re reverse side got out of the water for it to be as efficient as they thought it was going to be um if the if they'd come up with some method as they had promised to try and fix that those issues and actually got them to work on something approaching what the basic calculations said they could do then yes they could have been of quite considerable use in merchant service because well in the liner world you would have been able to move even faster which is obviously what they wanted in ocean liners before aircraft came along and for merchant vessels you would be able to move at roughly the same speed with considerably better fuel economy which is very important for the merchant ships 
there would be a few disadvantages. I imagine these things would probably have a considerably deeper draft than an equivalent displacement ship, um, because obviously you still have to displace a certain amount of water to remain buoyant, and if you're doing that in relatively narrow wedges, those wedges are going to have to go much deeper in the water. So it probably restrict the harbours that these things could actually use, but then again, with the efficiency of them, you might even have a situation where you could use them for the bulk of the crossing and then just have a bunch of smaller coastal craft ferrying stuff back and forth into the harbour itself. Pretty much on a slightly larger scale version of what was actually done in a lot of Age of Sail harbours with merch with the larger merchant ships. But could they have been of use in, mer in military service? Um, generally speaking, no. Because, well your propulsion system makes up pretty much all of your broadside so whilst by the time these things are being invented the broadside of ships is based on mostly gun turrets and casements so you don't need the full broadside available like you would have done in the age of sail or the early ironclad era the flip side to that is you know any any shell practically that comes in is going to smash your propulsion system into tiny pieces as well as you know cause significant flooding as that wheel takes a hit and then rotates around underwater so from a warship perspective they are almost completely and utterly useless um, with the exception of perhaps high-speed military transports or possibly again assuming they managed to work out all the issues and assuming that these things scaled up possibly aircraft carriers because obviously with aircraft carriers you want speed and big flat areas which this could afford you and the aircraft carrier is significantly less at risk of coming under direct shell fire. I mean it, they'd still be hideously vulnerable to torpedoes because a torpedo to one of these rollers would be simultaneously destroying a good chunk of your buoyancy and a good chunk of your propulsion. But there could have been a marginal use of them for aircraft carriers but not for gun based warships. Matt Blom asks, During your recent trip to the USS New Jersey, some of the footage suddenly made me consider the amount of ductwork and piping travelling between different parts of the ship. Were these weak points that could threaten damage or flooding between holes during battle, or were mitigation efforts taken to ensure these points did not prove weaknesses? They potentially could be weak points. It essentially depended on how well they were planned out and then how well they were sealed and how well those seals were maintained. So, as designed originally and as built, any piercings of bulkheads would have been purposely drilled, purposely packed, purposely sealed, so that, okay, it's, it is a theoretical weakness and a blast nearby might open up the, those um, points, but if you're just having to deal with flooding... I'd say just having to deal with flooding, then they shouldn't impose any significant danger to the ship. Um, apart from anything, um, a lot of them would be placed quite high up within a chamber. So by the time you did get to them with flooding, um, it would be quite pro you would have been quite progressed into the ship flooding anyway. Um, and it also means there's a you know, relatively small area to shore up. But as ships continue in service, more and more things are added, and that means more and more weak spots and obviously more um, reduced strength to the bulkheads. But it's also about where these things are rooted. So this is a view of Broadway on USS New Jersey, and you can see there is a lot of uh, pipework and wiring going up along the ceiling there and obviously through the bulkheads. But one of the ways to avoid as, as many weak points as possible is to do something like this by, you know, okay, Broadway then becomes somewhat more at risk, but the individual compartments on either side become somewhat less at risk because they have less bulkhead piercings. Now, where it could become a significant issue is not just the unplanned stuff, because obviously that introduces potential weak spots in areas where the original designers hadn't planned for them to be, but also what level of maintenance is done on them. And that would actually be a major issue at Pearl Harbor, something that obviously the US Navy would take a lot of lessons from. But uh, the reason, for example, why Nevada ended up sinking pretty much where she did, or she was beached, but the reason, one of the reasons she needed to be beached was 
insignificant part due to the fact that since she'd been built she'd had a lot of refits and repairs and so forth that had introduced lots of additional cabling and pipe work in areas where as I indicated earlier the ship's designers hadn't counted on it being and she was in a relatively poor state of maintenance which meant that even when all the actual you know hatches and everything were closed up water was still coming through in significant amounts from poorly maintained seals or you know, even penetrations where there weren't seals and hence she ended up obviously being beached and this was a problem across the pacific fleet battleships that weren't completely um in the drink like oklahoma uh, utah and arizona obviously but you know for ships like california uh, as well as nevada this was a, a major issue and of course, if you don't, con even with something that's fairly well maintained, if you don't continue that maintenance, it can become a weak spot. Sam Signorelli asks In past videos, you've mentioned that the bigger the gun, the slower the rate of fire. Did any Navy consider teaming up smaller gunned capital ships with a higher rate of fire, with bigger hitters, such as a 16 inch armed ship, to rain down shells on an enemy in something akin to covering fire whilst the big gun zeroed in? Not really. Um, certainly not in the main period that the, you'd, you'd be thinking about, i.e. the Dreadnought period. Um, in the pre-Dreadnought period, that's effectively what the secondary and tertiary batteries are, except they're all contained with, within one ship. Um, but in the Dreadnought period, no. Partly, there's obviously budget considerations. There's not really any Navy that in the Dreadnought period that's going to be able to stump up the cash for a bunch, bunch of full-size capital ships. And... A bunch of smaller faster firing capital ships but there's also a few other things to take into account one of which is that at the longer ranges that the dreadnoughts were capable of engaging in your average rate of fire actually went to about around a minute because of the need to spot the fall of shot make corrections etc 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 so whilst a lot of 14, 15, 16 inch guns had theoretical rates of fire that might be usually around one round every 30 seconds or 35 seconds and occasionally a little bit quicker. Practically speaking, those rates of fire were rarely, if ever, actually used because, as I said, the long distance of the engagement precluded that. Because, you know, if you're going to fire a salvo and it's going to take 35 seconds for that salvo to arrive, you then only once that salvo arrives can you process the changes that you need to make to where the guns need to be aimed. So at that point, you know, even if you've got the next salvo ready to go, you have to wait a minimum of five seconds, even if you see hits, um, and you probably aren't going to. So what the rate of fire theoretically at a maximum of about one round every 30 seconds gave everyone was that it meant under battle conditions when people are stressed people are tired obviously then the rate of reloading decreases and various other factors that might interfere with your ability to reload but it meant that on your average one salvo per minute rate of fire you could almost guarantee assuming that something hadn't gone horribly wrong to have all your guns there and ready to go so having ships that could fire even faster than that isn't really going to help anything um, unless your approach is just spray the area in shells and hope that something hits. But, well, that hadn't worked out particularly well for BT. So, yeah. And the other factor to consider, of course, is can those smaller shells actually do anything to the target if they hit? Now, obviously, you know, upper works and so forth can always be smashed up. But is it worth investing millions of pounds or dollars or yen or whatever your currency of choice happens to be to get a ship that maybe can't actually really hurt the main armament or the citadel of the targets that it's firing at. You know, wouldn't it just be better to build, to spend a bit more money to get a second ship that can do those things? Uh, and it's really only when you get up to 18-inch guns, really, and theoretically larger, that the rate of fire starts to approach the rate that you can realistically get salvos off at, at which point maybe having some ships with faster firing weapons might be useful but those fast firing weapons would be you know 16 inch guns
The Rogue Chief asks, On numerous occasions you've spoken about how laminated armour is not as effective as solid plate in equivalent thicknesses. But I remember hearing about how the armour of Greek hoplites gained its strength because it was laminated, with layers of leather and linen obtaining a strength similar to metal armour. Why the discrepancy? Is it a matter of working with different kinds of material? In very crude terms, yeah, pretty much. Um, lamination works to increase the strength, efficiency, or some other positive aspect of a total object when you're working with two or more different types of material with different properties that then reinforce each other. So um, an example that's not strictly an armour-based example, for example, would be the English longbow when it's made out of yew. Yew is a naturally laminate wood where you have heartwood and sapwood. Um, the sapwood is the softer, paler wood that is on the outside of the tree. The heartwood is the denser, um, darker wood that's on the inner part of the tree. So when you bend the bow, if you have it set the right way around, obviously, then you have the darker heartwood inside, which is very resistant to compression, and the more elasticated sapwood on the outer face of the bow, which is very um, flexible and resistant to extension or tension. And so, obviously, as you bend the bow back, then you would have the inner part, which is being crushed, is made up of a material that resists crushing, and the outer part, which is being stretched, has a is made up of a material that resists stretching, and both want to return to their original forms, and so you get a usually significantly more efficient uh, bow than something that's made out of a single piece of wood. If you took two sections of heartwood and laminated them together, or two sections of sapwood and laminated them together to get the same thickness as a u-bow that was made of both heartwood and sapwood it wouldn't work anywhere near as well and a similar principle applies when it comes to armor so if you have in the case of the um, greek hoplite armor leather and linen and the material that's used to bind them together pretty much similar to things like fiberglass what you're effectively doing is combining a material that's very tough and good at absorbing impact, stretching, and diffusing force with a material that's very hard, for a relative definition of the term, uh, which gives it durability and resistance to impact in the first place, resistance to deformation. And in some ways, the uh, on the, another example of uh, lamination that actually works is things like katana edges, where the edge is very hard and the back is softer. So in some ways, you know, back capital ship armor, once they start armoring it, is still in certain ways a laminate material. In the case of the ironclads, you have the iron, the hard part, with a backing of wood, which is softer, but helps spread impact out a bit better and also um, will absorb splinters and so forth. And then that moves on to being compound, where you have steel, which is the hard bit, and we're now backed with iron, which has taken the place of wood as the soft bit, although you often still have wood behind that. And then once you get face-hardened armour, you have, kind of like the longbow made out of you, a single material laminate, where you have a hardened face and a softer back, and even then you still sometimes have a wooden back. But all of these are using different material properties layered together to reinforce and support each other, creating something that is greater than the sum of its parts. If, however, you just take identical bits of material and stack them one on top of the other, then they are, they, there is no real benefit to doing that. Um, in some niche cases, like with heat rounds or something, then having a spaced armour might help. Um, but if you're just going to you know, physically stack, in the, this is why we've got monitor up here, um, in let's say monitor's turret has eight inches of iron but it's eight one inch slabs of iron stacked one on top of the other it just doesn't offer anything near the resistance that a eight inch solid set sheet of art of iron would do because again using very crude expressions and crude explanations you're effectively having to break a bunch of much weaker sections which is considerably easier than breaking one whole thing. I mean, it's the whole thing, you know, to horribly you know, misuse a saying, to a certain degree, a chain is only as strong as its weakest link. Essentially, if you have a single thick thickness slab of something, you have to input enough energy to overcome the yield strength 
of that entire piece. Whereas with laminate armour, if it's made up of exactly the same material, just in thinner slices, you only have to input enough energy to break the first one. And if you can maintain that energy all the way through, then you will punch all the way through. Now, obviously, that means in practice you have to hit the outer layer with a lot more energy than you need to break it. But essentially, it's a case of does the decrease in energy that comes from shattering each successive layer of armor does that decrease in energy actually bring my final amount of energy that I need to break through the last plate down far enough that I can't break through the last plate? Chances are probably not, in which case you're going to go all the way through. Um, and it basically is that if you're going in reverse, if you like, from that last plate is the curve of energy I need to add going further up. Does that starting point of energy end up being the same greater or less than the amount of energy I'd need to break through the thing as a single unit. And with pretty much all forms of metal armor, it turns out that you need less energy to break through multiple successive layers of something than to break through one single slab of the same thing. John Graubard asks, after seeing the video on USS Marblehead, did the ABDA fleet stand a chance against the Imperial Japanese Navy? And if not, why wasn't it withdrawn before losses occurred? This is a case of what's on paper doesn't necessarily translate into reality. Because on paper, at the start of December 1941, ABDA Command has 11 modern-ish light cruisers, um, a couple of older light cruisers that are probably only really used for the second line vessels, two heavy cruisers, and at least for a short while until Forsett is sunk, um, a battle cruiser and a battleship in the shape of Repulse and Prince of Wales, plus, you know, several dozen destroyers. Now, that is actually enough, as long as the Japanese don't show up with carriers um, or capital ships, that's actually enough to throw back a lot of the Japanese invasion convoys. Because when you look at those invasion convoys, a lot of them are escorted by two, three, four cruisers, and a dozen destroyers, give or take a little bit. You know, there might be, there are some convoys that are escorted by half a dozen destroyers, there are some convoys that are escorted by a few more cruisers than that. Now, granted, a lot of the Japanese cruisers are quite heavily gunned, and this is where the on paper starts to break down, because Yes, you have something like Houston, which is a full-fledged treaty-era heavy cruiser, albeit an older one. You have Boise, a very, very capable, full-sized treaty light cruiser. But then you also are including things like Marblehead and much older Omaha class. Uh, there's a whole slew of British cruisers. Um, there's 3D class, uh, an E class, and Exeter. But Exeter, whilst technically a heavy cruiser, is a small one. And the other light cruisers are all very much start of the interwar period. You've got the Dutch cruisers. Again, light cruisers on paper, but somewhat smaller than average. And then you've got Perth and Hobart, which are both Leanders. Again, they're not full 10,000 tonners. Now, granted, not every Japanese cruiser is a full 10,000 tonner, but there's a lot more 10,000 tonners out there than there are in ABDA command. They don't have any carriers, but in theory, they're supposed to be operating under land-based air cover, at least in part. But then again, you know, is the land-based air cover available? Is it cooperating with them? Is it modern enough to take on the Japanese? Um, all of this is obviously based on intelligence assessments, which may or may not have been particularly accurate. <laughs> um, and then, of course, you have the big elephant in the room, which is obviously the Japanese carrier forces and their capital ships. If Prince of Wales and Repulse had survived long enough, then that would provide ABDA command with a central core force, which could really punish pretty much any Japanese convoy escort. But, obviously, one, they didn't. And even if they had, then, well, the Japanese have considerable numbers of capital ships that can move in to try and counter them. So... It's a combination of the paper strength looks a lot stronger than it actually is in reality. The estimations of what the Japanese could do in terms of their air power, but also in terms of at sea, tended to be quite dramatically underestimates. And 
also, at least for one of the people in ABDA command, namely the Dutch, this was basically the last redoubt of major Dutch holdings, so they, they at least didn't really have much of a choice but to at least try and stand and fight. And that all led to the ABDA command sh being thought as you know something that could actually at least slow the Japanese down, because the other thing to remember is, of course, whilst the Dutch were pretty much using the last of their navy, um, and we haven't talked about subs yet, but the British, the Americans, and the Australians all did have additional ships that they could feed into the command if it only it could hold out for a few days, weeks, months. But as it turned out, obviously, a lot of these things, as we just indicated, weren't actually in line with the, the reality of things. And so they were thrown into battle, uh, often thrown into battle without concentrating their forces as well due to some conflicts and miscommunications. And then everything falls apart and you get what happened to ABDA command. Greg M asks, during extended periods of peace, navies necessarily promote officers to flag rank based on criteria other than a large scale command experience in combat. Are there any navies that stand out, positively or negatively, in their ability to identify flag officers who should be in command when the next war arrives? Unfortunately, you can... For any navy that has actually been in existence for any particular length of time, you can usually point out significant periods where they are both really, really good at recruiting officers and keeping officers in the fleet during peacetime that would be necessary for another war, and periods where they equally stand out as being spectacularly bad at doing so. So, unfortunately... To say that there's any particular navy that in a time of peace is actually really, really good at retaining the correct kind of officers, or really, really bad, it's not really possible to do that, because for every example that I could list for any given navy, uh, you could list two or three counterexamples of the opposite. Um, what I would broadly suggest, however, is that where you see a period where a navy does a particularly good job of keeping people with the right kind of qualifications to actually fight a war in the senior ranks of the service tends to be scenarios where the navy has previously been in conflict it's and it's been in conflict long enough for officers who maybe have come in during an extended period of peace and really don't know what they're doing to be found wanting and quietly put aside them to be replaced by officers who actually somewhat know what they're doing and for the lower ranks to then fill with officers who also have gained a fair amount of battle experience and the reason you need that is because once you get into a time of peace the people who have fought actively and gained a lot of experience in the war will obviously know what to look for but the senior leadership will only have a few years maybe a decade or so left in post so at that point you want essentially everybody who's left at the lower level ranks commodores captains etc even all the way down to lieutenants or lieutenants depending on what service you're in to have enough combat experience so that when the admirals and vice admirals start to retire they can then select their replacements from rear admirals and commodores and captains who still know what they're doing and of course those men when they reach the higher ranks will hopefully continue that obviously at that point they're probably now selecting from officers who've never seen combat but they still know what they need to look for and that will usually buy you two, three decades, maybe slightly more of time where your peacetime navy will be able to maintain its edge, if you like. But inevitably, if you have peace that runs longer than that, you'll end up now with a full rank of senior staff who have never actually seen combat and things will start to devolve. And obviously there'll be a, a gradual dissolution of fighting capability along the way. The other risk, of course, is if you have a war that's short and sharp, so your snapshot of your navy at the time will have some combat experience, not necessarily all 
not necessarily comprehensive combat experience and not everyone in the navy has combat experience then you will end up with perhaps a false illusion especially from civilian higher command whether that be presidents or prime ministers or defense ministries or whatever that they'll think oh well the navy has seen combat therefore the navy knows what it's doing when it comes to selecting people who to fight the next war and in actual fact you know maybe a good chunk of the navy hasn't seen combat and the ones that have maybe have only seen one type of combat for a few months and so things will devolve a lot more quickly in those circumstances and occasionally you will have navies especially in that latter scenario who might turn around and say oh you know we're going to completely ignore the lessons and performance of captains who have performed under fire and admirals who have performed under fire in our evaluation of further ranking um, because well it's unfair to those people who didn't get to go, go and shoot at somebody mentioning no navies in particular now, of course, you can occasionally have standout admirals who will reach the higher ranks and will actually do something very useful in terms of preparing a navy to fight another war, people like Fisher or Sims. Um, but they tend to be the exception rather than the rule. They tend to end up having a lot of kickback and pushback from admirals and other staff who don't like what they're doing because it's upsetting their nice, neat mostly peaceful navy in a peacetime world and you you and those officers tend to be even rarer fines because they have to be skilled not only in obviously hopefully battlefield command when it comes to it or identifying those who will do well in battlefield command they also have to be adept at the ridiculous amounts of long-term peace of politics that you get in a long-term peacetime navy chief eye roll asks in your opinion, would it be more or less likely that the Congo-class battlecruisers would have been retained into World War II if they'd been built with 13.5-inch guns? I think overall probably slightly less. Um, now, granted, with 13.5-inch guns, they would have had slightly more weight, assuming they were built to the same size and overall displacement anyway. They would have had slightly more weight to accommodate other upgrades, but it would have been only slight. They're still the oldest... Uh, capital ships in the Japanese fleet at this point. The Fusas in Yamashiro is obviously being slightly newer. Um, their main saving grace is when it came to the Second World War was that their baseline speed meant that modern, you could modernise them up to being you know, fast units in World War II definition as much as they were fast units in World War I definition. And because they had exactly the same armament in terms of gun calibre as the Fusos and the Yamashiros, it meant that, and at least until the Yamatos came online, the Japanese Navy was a 14-inch gun navy with a fairly simple logistics train, with the exception of the special snowflakes that were Nagato and Mutsu. If you remove that and you now have a 13.5-inch armed cruiser, or battle cruiser, I should say, then you've got a decent cruiser killer, but the performance of the guns will be slightly less which makes them slightly less attractive to use in a battle line engagement granted the 13.5 inch or a 14 inch gun will quite happily kill cruisers doesn't really matter which gun to be perfectly fair but it does add an additional logistical challenge for the japanese because now they've got to supply 13.5 inch and 14 inch and 15 inch uh, sorry and 16 inch and then once yamato uh, enter service 18.1 inch shells that's not a good logistical situation to be in. So I think if they'd been built with 13.5-inch guns, the Japanese would either have looked to upgun them, even if it was just a simple upgunning to 14-inch to make things logistically easier, or they would have gone in with one of the Congo replacement designs that had been drawn up in the early 1930s and then revised it and gone in for building those replacements somewhat earlier than historically which was, in theory, going to be the B-65s, B-64, B-65 designs. Nicholas Rassar asks, Were any submarines caught in Typhoon Cobra, or any of the following ones, and how did they fare? Yes, actually, a number of submarines were caught in the Typhoon, although they weren't directly attached to Halsey's force, they were passing through the area or attached to other forces, um, and a number of other Typhoons, obviously, as you mentioned, during the war. 
<clears throat> One of them, at least, actually survives. This is USS Pampanito, uh, obviously in a slightly later format, but she actually sailed through Typhoon Cobra in very close proximity to Halsey's forces. And, <laughs> well, it... it wasn't a pleasant experience because bear in mind that unlike more recent submarines they didn't have the option of diving down and remaining at depths for two or three days until the thing blew over um, i mean in theory you could try and dive and outride the worst of it but one the currents kicked up by the typhoon if, if you didn't get deep enough might carry you to places you didn't want to be two Wave action doesn't stop on the surface, so you'd still have issues. Uh, three, obviously that wave action might then drive you down deeper than you want, which is a very bad thing to happen to a submarine. And uh, fourth, obviously, if you if the typhoon lasts for longer than you have battery power, you're now faced with the rather unenviable job of trying to surface in the middle of a typhoon. So Pampanito ran the typhoon on the surface, and had a lot of problems with water coming on board because of course while she's running on the surface you have to keep an air supply to the diesel engines so one of the survivors actually mentioned that one very unfortunate chap had to be stationed at the conning tower hatch and his job was to keep the hatch open and whenever he saw or felt a wave about to roll over the bridge he had to close it but he couldn't keep it closed for too long because otherwise the diesels would use up all the air in the sub. So as soon as it was feasible to do so, he had to open the hatch again and so on and so forth and so on and so forth for basically the better part of three days. I mean, obviously not the same guy all the time, but that's how long it took. And uh, the account and it goes on to relate that after the typhoon, Pampanito was described by her crew as a wreck. Inside, every, almost everything had broken loose. The superstructure was caved in, and many of her steel deck plates were missing. And many times during the typhoon, uh, she was described as quivering on the crest of a wave, and the crew thought she might actually break in half. Uh, they ran on one engine the entire time. Lemongello asks, At any point, do more smaller main battery guns, say 12, 14-inch guns, trump fewer larger main battery guns like eight 16 inch guns on a battleship that has 20th century fire control i.e does more guns cause an increased chance of a hit and can uh, larger guns increase the chance of a critical hit or more likelihood of penetration there is arguably a point but it's a very artificially created point which is the mid going on mid late 1930s and that's purely because of the washington and later London naval treaty restrictions. As a general rule of thumb, as battleships get larger, and therefore capable of supporting either more smaller guns or fewer larger guns, people tend to slap more armour on them, which necessitates the larger guns, because the threshold is essentially, paradoxically, to try and design your battleship to be protected against its own guns at a given battle range, but also to try and design your ship so that its guns can penetrate your enemy's armour at said effective battle range. Which, that kind of circular paradox is basically why you get the consistent escalation in size and firepower. So the only way where you're going to get a situation where having more smaller guns, which ordinarily would then struggle to penetrate the new generation of ships armor and therefore wouldn't be worth it is when there's some kind of artificial constraint on how big you can make your ship hence the treaty restrictions at which point if you can design a smaller caliber and therefore lighter weapon that is reasonably capable of punching through any reasonable amount of armor you can fit on a restricted tonnage then that makes more sense than fewer larger weapons because as you indicated with modern fire control if you have say 12 guns to your opponent's nine you have three more chances to hit per salvo and if if um, you're say using 14 inch guns and your opponent's using 16 inch guns yes those 16 inch shells might hit a little bit harder but a 14 inch shell to a magazine or a 14 inch shell to the machinery space is probably going to be just as bad as a 16 inch shell um because of the considerably greater effects that are going to be incurred from either magazine explosion or the huge amount of flooding that occurs. But, obviously, there will be a, a small amount of damage reduction because of the small amount of explosives. 
a board but if both can get through the armor then you might as well go for fewer but so for more smaller guns because you'll get more chances to hit and therefore possibly also more hits and two penetrating 14 inch hits will probably will almost certainly do considerably more damage than a single 16 inch hit um but that is a very a product of the very artificial constraints of that that treaty system thy hunter 61 asks why did no one else go with a long lance style torpedo going into world war ii well there's two main elements that make the long lance stand out primarily i mean there's a few other bits but mostly it's its size and the range and speed granted to it by having a oxygen power plant as opposed to a compressed air power plant and you know from that derives the lesser bubble trail and all of this other kind of stuff in terms of size it's a 24 inch torpedo as opposed to a 21 inch torpedo which is what you'll find on pretty much all submarines and all surface ships and then the 18 inch is usually the aerial version now larger torpedoes had been experimented with in fact there was a larger torpedo in service there was the 24 and a half inch torpedo on nelson and rodney which in some ways actually inspired or confirmed depending on which source you read uh, the japanese decision to head over in the in the direction of oxygen enriched and then pure oxygen driven torpedoes um, so a large torpedo that used an increased amount of oxygen in its propulsion system did exist elsewhere let's say that was basically nelson and rodney's torpedo however um, the larger torpedo size was felt to be a negative for submarines which were very cramped for space anyway and it was also felt to be a negative for surface ships because again it made the torpedo carrying and launching mechanisms considerably heavier which meant space and weight was taken up there that could be used elsewhere and the 21 inch torpedo therefore meant you could have more torpedoes which meant it would be easier to hit something for a given amount of weight so if you had say a quadruple a torpedo launcher at 21 inch for this roughly the same weight and vol and uh, area taken up you might only be able to get a triple 24 inch so yeah your 24 inch torpedo might carry a bit more fuel it might carry a bit more explosives it might be more deadly when it hits but if you launch a spread you only have a one in three well you have three chances of hitting as opposed to the quadruple which you have four chances of hitting and so most people were happy to stay with the 21 inch for the most part the other element the oxygen enriched or pure oxygen system that is basically down to the difficulty and danger of actually operating it so yes compressed air gives you a slightly slower speed it gives you a much shorter range and it creates a bubble trail but compressed air is only really dangerous in one aspect the fact that it's compressed um whereas pure oxygen <laughs> that's dangerous in oh so many ways of various forms of combustion and um de rather rapid decomposition uh, the various mechanisms you need to create it rather than just a pump um, and store it and so on and so forth so there's a lot more reasons to be worried about using pure oxygen the only reason that you really would justify it with all the safety hazards and additional complications that come from having it is if you absolutely want and need this additional range and speed for the purposes of your fleet which the japanese did because as i said you know the british did have an enriched oxygen torpedo in service they just didn't think that it the benefits it gained were really worth deploying across the fleet and others had experimented with it dm phoenix asks on the topic of warship gunnery crews during a naval surface gun action age of sail through world war ii what were gun crews doing when their side of the ship was facing away from the opposing vessel do they have tangible supporting roles assisting in firing the firing side in some fashion or were they just a constant hot standby until they had something to shoot at it very much depends on what time period so in the age of sail you would have a single large gun crew 14 to 16 would be the typical number and if the ship was engaging in a broadside action where the target was on one side they would all be manning the relevant gun on that side but uh, 
if they were engaging targets on both sides, then that gun crew could split into two teams of seven or eight, or less when casualties were incurred, and fight both guns. So in the Age of Sail, generally speaking, everybody would be on the fighting side, unless they were both sides were the fighting side. As time goes on, if you are still in the era where you have a uh, hull-to-hull gun deck, so central battery ironclads, broadside ironclads, that kind of thing, you'd still have at least elements, if not in the entirety of the gun crews, all on one side doing their best to fight on the side that was engaged. But obviously during the Steam era, battles like Lissa could get much more into a melee, so you'd have people on both sides um, a lot of the time. Once you get into the era of the turret, um, so the latter part of the 19th century, well, obviously the turrets generally tend to be on the center line, apart from, as you can see here, with a invincible class or something. Um, but once the crews are confined to turrets or gun galleries for the uh, barbette mounts, uh, casement mounts, or secondary turrets later on, then those gun crews would pretty much just have to stay at their station and wait until, or if, their guns came into action. Because to get out of their position and make their way over to the other side to try and help out, well, usually there wouldn't be a too, too much they could do to help out. The space would be fairly cramped and confined and they'd have a fairly generous gun crew already. And it would also take them quite some time. And that would be longer than it would be for them to get back if the ship turned to present its other broadside or another enemy ship showed up. So essentially, as long as gun decks were open from one side of the ship to the other, everyone would try and help out as best they could for the most part. But as soon as things became divided by hatchways and passageways and locked doors, etc., then everyone has to pretty much stay put. Nathporn Hong Sharon asks, in Drydock 191 at 5435, there's a picture of Admiral Lee and two more officers. Who are these two? And what do their careers look like? Apparently, the Google's image search doesn't know about them. So on the left, you have Admiral Lee's flag lieutenant, Raymond W. Thompson Jr. And on the right is his flag secretary, Richard Zern. So Lieutenant Thompson appears to have eventually reached the rank of captain. He served on destroyers post-war and then served on uh, shore duties before retiring in 1963 and then joining NASA. Uh, I base that on the fact he's listed as Captain Retired uh, in one of his postings at NASA. And he worked there for about a decade, retiring in 1974. Richard Zern managed to reach the rank of Rear Admiral upon retirement. Um, he retired in 1957 and his intervening career after World War II, seemed to alternate. So at one point he was in charge of, I'm probably going to horribly mispronounce this, but the fleet oiler Chizkaskia, Chizka Chizkaskia, I think that's how it's pronounced. Um, he spent a lot of his time in shore commands, and then um, he also was commander of Destroyer Squadron 4, uh, aka Destroyer Division 41, um, in the 50s. But he managed to reach uh, Rear Admiral rank, then retired. Um, he actually died the year after he retired in 1958. Christian B. asks, The USA had the Panama Canal. The Germans had the Kiel Canal. What were the size limitations for British ships? The Suez Canal? Whilst the Panama Canal was something of a soft limit for the Royal Navy, they weren't necessarily entirely wedded to the idea of having Panamax-only ships, as can be seen from some of the uh, 1922 designs, like the G3s and N3s and the subsequent that they were looking at. The Suez Canal also, believe it or not, wasn't really too much of a restriction. The Suez Canal had, by that point, been dredged a couple of times to make it deeper, so as far as the British were concerned, if they absolutely had to, they could just dredge the thing or just artificially lighten the ship to get it through. No, um, what the British were more concerned about when it came to ship size limitations was this place and uh, two other places like it. This, if you haven't already guessed, is Gibraltar. Uh, 
and that dry dock there in the foreground is the cause of oh so many size consternations um, hood and the g3s in particular because the gibraltar dry dock um, to a lesser extent the one in malta and the ones that were available in singapore were the primary drivers of size restrictions on royal navy capital ships in the 1910s and 1920s and actually going forward as well simply because there were some pretty big dry docks in Britain. Um, you know, large enough, okay, maybe only one or two, but still there were one or two that were large enough to accommodate any reasonable sized capital ship you might want to build. But Britain had an empire, and they didn't want to get into a scenario where they might have a ship that needed dry dock treatment, whether that be for immediate battle damage or just refit or repair in general and then have to take it away from, say, Australia or India or the South Atlantic or the Mediterranean and have to make it go all the way back to Britain, potentially, bear in mind, through hostile waters, to get back to have the necessary work done to it. And so the overriding concerns would normally, will it fit in Gibraltar and Singapore and to a lesser extent, Malta. If it won't, then we're going to have to shorten it so that it does. <laughs> and very occasionally a design would get through where they go, actually, you know what, stuff it, we're just going to do it to whatever the biggest size of dock in the UK is, and that's where the really big designs come from. Um, but for the battle cruisers, especially envisaged for lots of overseas service, this is the big restriction. Staffan Lindell asks... In the accounts I've read of the Four Days Battle, and in general in the Anglo-Dutch Wars, I'm struck by how difficult it must have been for the commanders to keep to a set of unified tactics in battle. To me it seems like especially the Dutch had issues with this. For example, Tromp repeatedly stomping off to do his own thing and even ships abandoning the battle after taking one prize. Do you find this assessment to be at all accurate, and in your opinion, what would have been the result if they had kept a more unified front against the English Navy? So there are two main issues when it comes to tactics and getting them all unified and on the same page, which are communications and culture. There's a tertiary one, which is personal relations between individual admirals, and that actually affects both sides to a certain degree and would continue to affect both sides um, through the first couple of hundred years more. But the main ones, as I said, are communication and culture. The culture side of things is actually something that the, the English Navy experienced a little bit earlier at the time of the Spanish Armada and so forth. By this stage, of well, at least the Anglo-Dutch War of the Four Days Battle, the Royal Navy has had a chance to at least somewhat professionalise and is a unified force, whereas back at the time of the Spanish Armada there were royal ships, there were private ships, there were sort of royal sort of private ships and the command staff was a mixture of nobility people who actually knew what they were doing on a ship um, privateers and merchant venturers and you know gentlemen sailors and so on and so forth um, so you know in the armada for example drake goes off after a prize quite happily even though he's supposed to be one of the main admirals when it comes to the dutch the dutch are, well, there's a reason that what they keep calling one of their ships De Zeven Provencian. The Dutch are a bunch of provinces which, up until very, very recently, at this stage of the Four Days Battle, had pretty much had their own navies with their own command structures, their own command staffs, their own ideas of tactics. Plus, there were a few people who were more in, in within the overall Dutch fleet who were more on the side of privateers with a vaguely official seal than you know, career naval staff. And so when it comes to sailing into battle, whoever you put in charge, you know, whichever province they're from, the other provinces will resent them to a greater or lesser degree. And hence, certainly in the early part of the Anglo-Dutch Wars, you have this kind of very disparate tactic set going on because everyone is kind of, you know, it's actually more a bunch of individual fleets vaguely under the loose banner of a single commander until the fighting starts. The other problem is communication. Now, at this point, the kind of flag signal system for communication that you'd see around the time of Nelson pretty much doesn't exist. Um, flag signals, such as they are, are a very, very limited set 
of specific instructions like attack or retreat um not really particularly complex uh, instructions despite the fact you're talking about hundreds of ships being involved in the battle and there's no way for anyone else to respond other than to kind of just do the thing that they're being instructed to do or not do it if they don't want to or they can't see the signal or whatever um or they think and this is the thing they might be able to see something going on elsewhere that means that that signal is actually a really bad idea to do but they can't actually tell the flagship that except by sending a boat out and waiting for it to get there which is obviously sometimes going to be impossible especially in the midst of battle now if admirals wanted to be a little bit more specific they could come up with their own little crib sheet but there's still a very limited number of flags that they can use again the, the full flag signal system has not been invented and that's only good for as long as the admiral is in command and usually is only good for a specific set of circumstances like a specific battle if the admiral has chosen to write them down so you know you might have a flag that's at the agreed signal for an attack a flag that's an agreed signal for a treat um, a flag that's an agreed signal for turning to port or turning to starboard um, and an agreed flag signal for forming the line of battle or something so you might have a combination thing so if you hoist uh, the turn to port and the line of battle signal that might mean form a line of battle to port or it might mean form a line of battle and then we'll turn to port people don't know so you can't do these kind of combination things unless you write it down at which point with your limited set of instructions you might be able to write now you know well if i fly this flag and this flag then i want you to do this specific thing but as I said, that's that's only basic. It's almost like a one-time cipher, if you like. And between the, those two issues, you have the issues that the Dutch fleet, fleet and, to a lesser extent, the Royal Navy faces. What would have been the result of four days' battle if they'd kept a more unified front? Well, it's difficult to say. It, it's four days long. I mean, obviously, better cohesion would have helped them somewhat, but. A four-day-long bat running battle with so many ships involved, with the, especially the communications issues thrown in, even if they'd vaguely had an idea of what they were all going to do going into it, command and control probably would have broken down somewhere around mid-afternoon on day one anyway. Darren Liu asks, What makes a Dromon a Dromon, and why are they so firmly associated with the Byzantines? How do they differ from galleys and triremes, biremes, etc.? Well, part of what makes a Dromon a Dromon is the designation Dromon, which is exceptionally unhelpful, I know, but um, the why it's so closely associated with, associated with the Byzantines is Dromon is a Greek term and reflects the centralization of power around Byzantium, which is, of course, in the Greek-speaking hemisphere of what had formerly been the Roman Empire, whereas you know, prior terms, Latin terms, um, and older Greek terms as well, for that matter, um, are associated with other eras. So dromon is a, a local local term, local language, local time period term, hence becomes associated with ships of that time period. As far as specific differences from other ships, um, dromons are the descendants of the smaller, faster vessels of the Roman Empire, typically called Liburnia. Um, they are usually held as being distinct from previous warships in as much as the rowing decks are fully decked in, i.e. there is a complete deck above the oars, which wasn't necessarily the case in the older ships, and they no longer rely on a big bronze ram at the front for their primary means of attack. Um, exactly what their bow shape it was underwater can be a subject for discussion but they there aren't records of them using their bows as actual full-on rams they did have these spurs which you can see kind of almost like a bowsprit up top but um, they were no longer primarily ramming dedicated vessels they in terms of sinking enemy warships they would quote unquote ram an enemy ship to try and board it but that's more of a controlled collision than the full speed we're trying to punch a hole in your side activities of earlier warships and of course some of the dromons were also equipped with greek fire projectors but that's not a distinguishing feature of a dromon so they're, they're eff effectively an evolved version of the smaller far effectively fast attack craft of 
the Ro the classic Roman Empire. Uh, as far as triremes, biremes, galleys, etc., there well, there is a separate Gallia type vessel, which is slightly smaller than a Dromon, which eventually will go on to become a galley. But when it comes to triremes, biremes, quadremes, quinqueremes, heptaremes, etc., octaremes, the main use of those is to effectively denote approximately a certain size because a byron might have two banks of oars a trireme might have three banks of oars but an octoreme or a heptoreme doesn't have eight or seven banks of oars it's referring to the number as far as we can tell at least of rowers per side on a given bank um so you might only you know you might have a quad quad or or quinqueream so let's say quinqueream so five might still only have two banks of oars. You might have two men on the lower oar, three men on the upper oar. A trireme might only have two banks of oars, you know, one on the lower, two on the upper, something like that. Um, but because it indicates a number of rowers, it's a rough indicator of size. Whereas dromons, you could have single bank dromons, two bank dromon, dromons, or three bank dromons. And of course, a three bank dromon will be considerably larger than a single bank dromon. Um, but the dromon is generally characterized by these other other features which I've explained just a minute ago. Leon Wu asks, starting with the Fubuki class, why did the Japanese have a preference for having their destroyers carry a single forward turret but two rear turrets? Only the Akazuki class departs from that design style. Well, it's a combination of factors. The Fubuki's introduced the twin 127mm or 5-inch gun mount to the Japanese destroyer arm, and they're pretty hefty weapons, you know, whereas the US Twin Mounts is a 5-inch 38 gu gun, this is a 5-inch 50 gun. So the gun's considerably weightier. And as you can see from this picture, the Fubukis have quite a high focal, and it runs for quite a uh, length. And this was done to improve sea keeping. But even though they're relatively large for destroyers of the time, this does run into the issue of if you try and put a super firing gun position forward, well, one, the bow is not particularly buoyant compared to the rest of the ship, so you're going to end up with a lot of plunging issues. But two, you you can kind of see the size of this twin 5-inch gun turret. If you put a super firing mount above that, you're going to also have to increase the bridge height, the superstructure height, to see above that, at which point you're going to end up with a rather top-heavy design and a very front heavy design um, which isn't a good thing especially for destroyers but for ships in general so by moving the second of three twin gun mounts to further back on the ship where the ship is wider not only do you have a you've solved a buoyancy issue to a certain degree because you're less likely to get plunging where the ship has a lot more width You've also managed to ensure that you can reduce the height of the superstructure, thus improving the ship's stability. Uh, you don't have to have a super firing gun mount atop the or what's already the highest portion of your ship's deck, which means, again, you've improved the ship's stability. Um, and it's also to a certain degree, although not as much, a reflection of what is your primary weapon. Because if your destroyer's primary weapons, you, as far as what you think you're going to be using, are your guns, so you're charging in, destroying other enemy destroyers, and so on and so forth, and then maybe launching torpedo attacks afterwards, then you might want more armament up front. Whereas if you're thinking that, well, your primary attack profile is with your torpedoes and the guns are there as an assist and to see off enemy destroyers when you get close, well, then it doesn't really matter really where your other two gun mounts are, especially when the super firing aft position is at the same level as your forecastle gun and as you can see uh, again from this photo has a pretty good frontal arc of fire and since fundamentally the requirements in terms of both stability and strategy didn't really change for japanese destroyers thereafter they pretty much stuck with the same formula as you noted for a good long while graham william kidd asks are there any incidents of a U-boat wolf pack in a pre-planned and coordinated manner intentionally attacking a convoy escort while surfaced? Not that I'm aware of. As I mentioned previously, attacks on convoys while surfaced, yes, definitely, but that was a thing wolf packs did. But attacking the convoy escort is basically a matter of necessity rather than something you actually want to do. 
so if an escort is in the way or you know you happen somehow to get the drop on it then fine but usually the subs are trying to evade the escorts um, so if you are attacking one it's going to be basically because you've been boxed into a corner or you've been afforded a one in a million chance neither of which are things that you're going to be able to do in a pre-planned and coordinated manner um, also attacking convoy escorts on the surface is a major issue because well certainly by the time the wolf packs are out there in force surface search radar is considerably longer range and has a full 360 degree view usually um not all the time but certainly even if it doesn't have a full 360 degree view the surface search radar will have a better range of view and longer brain detection range than the sonar will or aztec and so if you're gonna try and sneak up on an escort you're much much better off doing that underwater than on the surface because well a you're more likely to be detected and b if you do end up being detected on the surface you're going to probably end up in a gun duel and that's not a gun that's not a duel you can win um and the time it takes you to dive is going to give your es the escorts any amount of time they need to get close enough to well either shoot you while you're on your way down which is going to complicate the diving bit or going to give them a very very fixed data point at which to throw depth charges and hedgehogs at if you do manage to get underwater so yeah I, I mean there would have been cases where in theory there was a very small number of escorts so a large number of u-boats might have stood a chance of sweeping in with massive torpedo salvos but one that's a huge waste of torpedoes you could be using on merchant ships and two the really weakly defended convoys tend to be very early in the war before the full wolf pack system really gets going christopher villenfort asks in the video on the swedish ship gotland there was a comment about a bigger version of Gotland that might sound like a good convoy escort. This got me thinking. If you took something a little bit larger than a town class, say 12 to 13,000 tons, with a similar forward armament, so two triple six, an angled flight deck to make sure it avoids the front deck, and a side mounted superstructure, something like a miniature Kiev class, this would give you the ability to operate maybe 20 to 30 aircraft, uh, sorry, 15 to 20 aircraft. Would this be a viable concept for a destroyer leader dash convoy escort or a waste of time? And were there any proposals like this in the interwar period? There were proposals for a hybrid cruiser carrier, uh, which mostly had come out of the US in the interwar period. Um, they're actually very, very close to what you describe. Um, 12,000 tons and one of them, a CF2, has a main battery of six six-inch guns as well as a flight deck. Uh, the difference with the US proposal uh, at least for CF2, is that it has one triple forward, one triple aft, and the flight deck in between. Um, but there are proposals that have all the guns forward um, and the flight deck aft, but those use uh, a, a single triple eight. Then there's a few other designs that float around from other, other navies and within the US Navy as well. The main thing is that they've, obviously, you've got to have a hangar deck as well, and as a result, you, they just go with a straight flight deck rather than an angled flight deck well one the angled flight deck's not been in invented at that stage but there's not really much point to it because as I said, you need a hangar and if you've got the hangar then you've also got the height to get the flight deck over going straight over the turret so you don't need the the angling um but either way your description or some of the us ones as a convoy escort practically actually if they had had them built before the second world war broke out yes they might actually have made a decent convoy escort not so much a destroyer leader i think they'd be far far too vulnerable to destroy any destroyer gunfire that got close enough to hit them um, obviously theoretically their limited heavy main battery and aircraft should keep the destroyers away but you can't necessarily guarantee that um, but as a convoy escort yeah, that there's a certain degree of usefulness to them. Obviously, that you're basically talking about an escort carrier type air group, which is fine. Um, the main thing is making sure that your flight deck is long enough that you can land the aircraft on as well as take off. Because once, if you can't land the aircraft on the flight deck, there's no point in having it. Um, because in World War Two, if you 
just need to launch aircraft, um, but you can't land them on the deck. You might as well just go with catapults and cranes to recover them, because that you're going to be using the cranes anyway. Now, as a convoy escort, what would it give you? Well, it would give you the capability of launching anti-submarine aircraft to hunt U-boats. It would give you the capability of launching fighters to take out long-range reconnaissance aircraft that would come looking to help the fighters get guided in. And with, with you know, six six-inch guns, that would also give you the capability of fighting off uh, things like Hilfkreuzer, i.e. Uh, armed merchant raiders. But with a big hanger strapped on the back and six six-inch guns, you're not really going to stand much of a chance of fighting off something like a Hipper or a Deutschland, let alone a Scharnhorst or a Bismarck. So the armament side utility would probably be quite limited. So it would be a very it would be useful but it would be very a very expensive investment as opposed to the, the relatively limited investment that's needed for just a simple escort carrier my mum's basement needs more windows asks did halsey ever explain why he took the world wonders signal as a deliberate insult uh, the Quotes from the time make it clear that Halsey's chief of staff found Halsey's reaction extreme. Did he know at the time what the signal said? And in his book The Codebreakers, David Kahn reports the ensign responsible for adding those words to the signal said that they just popped into my head. This suggests there was some sort of official investigation into the matter. If so, did Halsey explain himself in more detail? I haven't come across a more detailed explanation from Halsey as to exactly why he thought the the um, World Wonders section was a deliberate insult. As far as um, Halsey's chief of staff finding Halsey's reaction extreme, well, not to put too fine a point on it, but Halsey was basically throwing a toddler temper tantrum on the bridge of his flagship, which is not conduct becoming an officer in any circumstances, at which point it is the duty of the chief of staff to say, hey, chill for a minute. You know, remember who you are and where you are. You know, just throwing your cap on the ground and stumping your feet, that is that is literally what toddlers do. Um, that's not what you want to do if you want to retain the respect of your men, if you're a high-ranking admiral. Now, as far as why he thought it was a deliberate insult, well, obviously most military messages are fairly terse. You know, quite short, they convey the absolute necessary required amount of information, no more, no less. So if something is extended beyond that, then it is clearly very deliberately added to make a point. At which point, if the World Wonders was actually part of the signal that was sent, then it obviously would have been, to Halsey's mind, if he's looking at it and going, okay, it, as far as he can tell, this has been deli deliberately added, specifically by Nimitz to make a point. And, well, if you read it um, out, it's very easy to mentally put an inflection onto it. Especially when you consider that, you know, one of the ways of adding emphasis to a message is to repeat a short section of it. So, in this case, um, Nimitz wants to know where Task Force 34 is, that the location of it um and what it's doing basically why isn't it where he thinks it should be so given all of that given the fact that halsey's under a lot of stress given the fact that he knows or should have known at this point probably does to some extent that some of his officers have been asking him to send the battleships back you know put all of that into one place and the fact that he thinks it, he believes obviously that he's heading north to a the carrier battle that he was has always been denied and then he gets the message through you know, as i said mentally you add inflection to it so i'll read the message as it was given to him but i'll put the inflection that would first come to mind bearing in mind everything we've just said where is repeat where is task force 34 the world wonders you see it's it once you put an inflection to it combined with the repeat repetition at the front it sounds basically like someone scolding you telling you you know it, it effectively what it's interpreting as is where's this thing that you should have done i mean really you should have told us where it is 
you haven't told us where it is, it probably isn't where it should be, now you really, really, really need to tell me what's going on and where this task force is. You know, everybody's wondering, well, where is Admiral Halsey's Task Force 34? <laughs> Everyone's expecting it to be in one place because you're supposed to be a competent admiral, and if you're not, well, why haven't you told us where it's gone? And, you know, have all of that crash through what Halsey's thinking at the time, and yeah, he's going to lose his rag just a little bit. Alec Ruby asks... Why didn't the US think about finishing development of the 14-inch 50 caliber Mark B guns as designed for the North Carolinas and refitting the New Mexico and Tennessee classes with them since the guns were lighter, more powerful, and had a marginal increase in rate of fire? It seems to me like a partial waste of an opportunity that could also have been a waste of precious tax dollars. Basically because by the time that the North Carolinas could be fitted with 16-inch guns. They hadn't even finished the prototype of the Mark B, the 14-inch. At which stage, you have to remember that this is mid to late mid-1930s. The US isn't thinking about retaining pretty much any of their 14-inch ships for any particular length of time. They're notionally potentially thinking about retaining the Tennessees for a short period, but the New Mexicos and anything earlier than them are, as far as they're concerned, due for the scrap heap in less than five or six years. And the Tennessees and Colorados are probably not around for too much longer after that. Now, with that in mind, given they haven't even finished the prototype, they'd have to go through the full development and testing cycle for the 14-inch 50 Mark B. They'd then have to place manufacturing orders for them, and bearing in mind that gun main gun manufacturing is one of the bottlenecks in ship production, that would be competing with the production of the 16-inch gun barrels for the North Carolinas and then later for the South Dakotas. I mean, the eye was would have the guns would have been finished before the eye was were constructed, but it it would be a huge investment in terms of money and uh, you know occupying, as I said, a very bottleneck industry in order to. As I, they're not going to bother rearming the New Mexicos. Maybe to manufacture a couple of dozen guns to rearm what, as far as the US is concerned at the time, is probably going to be their single oldest, single least useful pair of battleships. And by the time the guns are actually made, the ships are pulled in, the refit is done, any changes to the shell hoist system, etc., 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 need to be made, they'd be coming back out into service for maybe two or three years of further activity so it's just not a cost-effective strategy when in 35 36 37 the u.s is thinking that there isn't going to be a war until at least 42 43 maybe 44 by which point none of these ships that could actually use the 14 inch 50 mark b will be in service ash the lego guy asks have there been any ships from the early steam era up to the Cold War where a ship was built, launched and fitted out and upon sea trials was discovered to be so woefully poorly designed that it went straight for scrapping rather than even attempt to fix its deficiencies? This excludes ships that were converted to a different purpose, captured or destroyed by enemy action or sunk before a decision could be made. I'm not aware of any warships that suffered that fate. There were quite a number of ships that were broke, broken up on the slipways, but that was usually because they were cancelled or because a treaty said you couldn't build them anymore or something along those lines. And there were a few ships that were in the water um, that were then cancelled um, and broken up. So, you know, some of the Mackensons that were in the water, um, Saxon and Württemberg, Salamis, you know, all those holes were in the water, but not complete. But then obviously with Germany, losing world war one they were forced to dispose of those probably about the closest you'd get would be something like the sims class but even the sims class were immediately recalled when the issues became apparent to have their top weight readjusted because essentially even if you catastrophically badly design a warship with very very few exceptions like captain usually there's something you can do to fix it and fixing it is much cheaper than scrapping it. Uh, as far as civilian ships, there probably were, but I wouldn't know about them. <laughs>
Eric Van Duting asks, in Alan Zim's book, Attack on Pearl Harbor, he analyzes the idea that if the first wave had sunk any US carriers had they been present, the second wave dive bombers had orders to bomb the sunken ships to make it harder or impossible to repair them. He says this would have been a waste as it would have only increased the number of man hours required to repair the ships, but not the amount of time. If a sufficient number of hits were scored, wouldn't the damage have been so severe that it would have been like building a new ship, especially if complex parts like the machinery and lifts had been obliterated? Yeah, I think I'm going to have to disagree with him there. It depends on exactly what you're hitting the ships with, because obviously you mentioned the dive bombers. They're not carrying the world's biggest bombs, um, but obviously you have other bombers that are carrying somewhat larger weapons and... There's even some torpedo bombers, I suppose, who could re-attack sunken carriers. But just generally bombing an already sunken vessel, okay, I can see the point it might just cause a little bit of additional damage. And, well, West Virginia is a good example of the fact that some rather spectacular damage can be repaired. But there is a certain logic to continuing to bomb a sinking carrier or a sunken carrier depending on how quickly it's gone down because yeah there will be some things that will flat out increase the amount of time it needs to repair the carrier so um, let's say if the carrier's rolled over if you can then hit it on or near a prop shaft so you can blow that open um, bend the prop shaft that's gonna be a significantly increased repair job it's going to be much more difficult to seal it up to salvage the ship in the first place if indeed it can be salvaged and it's going to make getting the thing back to the states for full refit much much more difficult so that's going to massively extend the job if indeed the job can still be done and of course once the ship's on its side or upside down then attacking things like the magazines and the machinery spaces again will be much easier so yeah a bomb hitting the underside or the side of a ship and blowing a boiler or a turbine or a turboelectric drive unit off and sending that crashing and cascading through the machinery spaces that's not just a man hour thing that's a huge increase in the amount of work that's necessary and certain machinery that would have to be manufactured and the work of cutting down into the ship to get to the machinery to completely replace it as opposed to just dry it out and repair it and obviously, if you hit a magazine and you blow the thing in half, well, you ain't salvaging it at that point. That's why Arizona is still there. So there, there is a certain amount of logic to continuing to bomb uh, a sunken carrier to make it impossible to recover. And it is possible to make it impossible to recover, but it would require some rather precise hits and some rather precise locations. You know, two or three additional general hits to the hull probably... I mean, it'll slightly slow down the salvage process, but it might not necessarily make it completely non-viable. Jim Mahon asks, Drac, do you have any sense how much design time it might have cost to incorporate alternating boiler machinery spaces into USS Hornet CV-8 to reduce the known Yorktown-class vulnerabilities to torpedo hits? I understand that Hornet was considered an emergency build, and that's why the Yorktown design was largely used unchanged but not what the trade-off actually was, or if the trade-off tonnage was still a consideration at the time. We're talking quite a lot of time, if it's even possible to do, because there's a lot of issues. So for one thing, the engine room spaces, the distance between the internal bulkheads is less than the distance between internal bulkheads for where the boilers are. Um, that's because there's a bunch of fuel tanks either side of the engine spaces that aren't either side of the boiler spaces so either you're going to have to invent an interesting way of fitting into that space or you're also going to have to completely realign where the fuel tanks are kept and if the fuel tanks are being realigned then you're going to have to redo all the pipe work that both feeds the fuel to the boilers and also feeds the fuel from the refueling points to the tanks um, you're further going to have to redo all of that anyway because if you're moving the boilers then obviously that pipework needs to be reallocated the, all the steam lines are going to have to be reallocated because obviously now the boilers are in a different position they're going to have to feed into the engines which are in into the turbines which are in a different position you're going to have to completely redo 
where the propeller shaft runs are aboard the ship because you know whichever one of the machinery space the engine machinery spaces the turbines that you're going to shift further forward is going to dramatically extend that section's prop shaft so you're going to have to make a longer shaft alley longer prop shaft possibly if you're doing the forward of the two engine sections so the outboard engines you're also going to have to completely redo the angle that they're at you're basically redoing the entire lower few decks of the carrier at the very minimum you're looking at at least six months design work probably more and on top of that all the jigs and machinery production that was set up for Yorktown and Enterprise and all the experience that went into them is as much as that helped with the building of Hornet is going to be partially lost because you're basically building a completely different ship um, at but once you get much below the hangar level so yeah that would at that point the amount of time and of course the amount of money it's going to cost to do all that you're probably looking at delaying Hornet entering service by at least eight to nine months possibly a year and well look at the engagements that Hornet just about made it to and now imagine if she's not available John McCarthy asks, I've read that some sailing warships are described as good sailors. What sailing qualities earned them that name, and what design characteristics caused a ship to be a good sailor? Unfortunately, it's difficult to pin down a specific set of criteria that would make a ship a good sailor, because a lot of it depends on what that particular navy or even that particular captain wants in a ship. Um, so a ship could be described as a good sailor if it didn't roll excessively um, or if it was particularly quick under sail compared to its classmates or contemporaries. Or it might be described as a good sailor if it doesn't lean excessively under the influence of wind. Um, or it might be described as a good sailor if it's fairly agile. Um I mean, there are certain things you definitely that would definitely disqualify a ship from being a good sailor. So a ship that's overly slow, a ship that's very slow to answer the helm, a ship that doesn't turn very, very quickly, um, as in, you know, it has a large turning radius even once it answers the helm. Uh, it, it, in many ways, it's easier to list the things that disqualify a ship from being a good sailor. But, you know, so for a frigate, for example, having a good top speed and you know, not taking a much water over the bow, so maybe trimming slightly by the stern, but also being fairly sharp and responding to the helm, that would qualify her as a good sailor, whereas a for a ship of the line, then a gentle roll to allow easier gunnery and um, steadiness under adverse wind conditions, like a crosswind, would be more important perhaps than absolute top speed uh, or a particular turn of agility although agility would be welcome to a certain degree and again for a ship of the line uh, which relates to her steadiness is that how close do her lower gun ports get to water on in typical sea conditions so that would qualify partly under her good sailor category whereas for a frigate with a single deck of higher mounted guns that particular issue may not be quite as much important as whether or not, say, she can still move at a reasonable speed when she's several points off of the wind, which is very important for a frigate both in the pursuit and in the escape. History for Real asks, It's often been suggested that the sinking of RMS Titanic was due to critical design flaws and short-sighted engineering, but the current surveys of the wreck show a series of holes were caused along a significant length of the ship compromising quite a few compartments. From what I can find, compartmentalisation, particularly among civilian vessels at the time, was rather lacking and new. How, in your estimation, would a warship of the era, 1900-1912, fare against similar damage, assuming the holes themselves could not be plugged? And in particular, would you expect there to be much difference between a capital ship or a lesser warship? I suspect a warship would handle the situation far, far better. Um, essentially, because when you look at the deck plans of Titanic and then look at where she took the damage, 
there are some pretty large compartments that get breached and get breached pretty much immediately. Whereas if you look at the deck plans for contemporary battleships, um, which are the only things that kind of come close to the size of Titanic, then if you look at where, if you sort of superimpose these hit locations, which you can see in green there, um, over, say, the plans for something like USS Texas, which, okay, is a year or two later than Titanic, or an Orion or a Florida class battleship, which are contemporary to her, what you'll see is that there's a couple of layers of vo sealed void spaces on the exterior of the ship. Then there's a series of considerably smaller compartments in the bow. And when it comes to the engine spaces at this stage, there's not just the sealed void compartments. You've also got coal bunkers on either side. Uh, whereas in Titanic's case, uh, not only did the engine rooms pretty much go almost hull side to hull side, but the coal bunkers ran um, perpendicular to the hull. So, you know, there wasn't even that protection for the most part. So if the if a, if a battleship had hit the iceberg in the same way then for the first part being a glancing blow it's entirely possible that only the void spaces would have flooded so the ship would have taken on a list but those void spaces are already sealed and um, everything else is sealed up anyway so it would have been irritating and annoying and embarrassing but it could have easily gotten home if the ice had pushed well into the ship you know enough to not only break the outer skin of the hull but pierce the divider between the first and second void spaces and then pierce the inner bulkheads between the second void spaces and the interior of the hull assuming that the ship is closed up with all bulkheads etc and hatches sealed then the individual spaces that are going to be flooded are going to be considerably smaller in volume and the coal bunker is almost certainly going to provide at least a degree of protection for the forward engine space uh, even if they're for, there is an engine space that far forward, which there might well not be because, you know, gun turrets and so forth. Um, and now that would be a bit more serious because you've got major compartment flooding. So the ship would go, you know, it would be down by the bow and listing to starboard. But I'm still pretty sure a battleship would survive. Um, it would be somewhat more difficult. But the the biggest problem with Titanic was that the compartmentalization as you can see with the red markings only went up so high so as the bow went down further and further uh, eventually the water would overtop that's not really the case in warships warships are significantly more comp compartmentalized at the time but that's because warship crews have to put up with going through lots and lots of uh, dogged hatches and so forth uh, in a way that the passengers on a civilian ocean liner really would never allow and indeed the companies wouldn't allow because it would cut down on the amount of accommodation and hold space that they could use so when it comes to smaller ships i mean a destroyer would be pretty much stuffed because they're so tiny at that stage that ripping open that portion of their hull that'd be the end of them cruisers it would i think it would depend on the size and age of the cruiser um, i mean by that stage you're looking if you're looking for a contemporary to titanic i in 1909 1910s era cruiser like a town class obviously they don't have quite the same level of compartmentalization and void spaces as a, as a battleship but also they're faster so they and more agile so they probably would actually get out the way of the iceberg but to be perfectly fair yeah a smaller ship a sub 10,000 ton warship probably would be sunk just by the sheer length of gashes in its side opening up far too many spaces but a large military vessel like a battleship or a battle cruiser i'm pretty sure with the same amount of glancing blow would survive relatively speaking easily manani wanderer asks are there any notable instances of a real life instance of the it's just a flesh wound achievement from world of warships yeah there's actually a, a reasonable f amount that through history um, one of the most notable ones would actually be HMS Invincible. So for those of you who are unaware, the, uh, it's just a flesh wound achievement in World of Warships is gained where if you are sunk, but subsequently an enemy vessel sinks because of damage you've done to it, then you get this, it's just a flesh wound achievement, obviously <laughs> named presumably after the uh, knight from uh, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. 
So obviously that could be, you know, you both fire salvos of shells at each other, theirs arrives first, then yours arrives and takes off their last health after you've died. More commonly, it's fire damage or flooding from torpedoes or torpedo hits that give you the achievement. But nonetheless, Invincible pretty much gets the It's Just a Flesh Wound achievement on Lutzau because it's her shells that um, do the critical damage that causes the major flooding on Lutzau that eventually leads to her being sunk. Uh, then you've got Cormoran versus Sydney. Exactly which one sank first, I'm not entirely sure of, but well, obviously one of them sank and then the other sank from damage that the the former had inflicted upon them, so somebody gets the achievement there. And although very deliberate, most ships that were sunk by fire ships would probably count for this, um, in as much as one, one or the other, well, usually the fire ship will go up before the ship that's been set fire to um, so technically that's a, a version of it roadrunner meep meep asks what is it about the main guns on battleships that give them such a long lead time as a machinist they don't look too hard or time consuming to make however i've never had to make a gun much less a battleship cannon also do you plan on visiting visiting holbrook and hmas otway when you come to australia as far as otway is concerned i'm don't know exactly. Um, Australia schedule should be being published when I get back from the SMH conference at the end of this month. Now, as far as why it takes so long for the main guns of battleships to be manufactured, it's the c massive complexity of the stages that are needed. So there's actually a, vi a very old video from the 1900s, early 1910s, that's available on YouTube, which shows the construction of the or part of the construction process for a 12 inch Armstrong gun. Um, so that'll give you some idea, but essentially they've got to first make a huge steel ingot that weighs, you know, 70, 80 tons or more. That's got to be heated and pressed into approximately the correct shape. Then, and this is for a wire wound gun, by the way, um, then you've got to um, take it out and basically turn the exterior on a giant lathe slowly because you know, you now imagine trying to precision mill an entire gun barrel, as you can kind of see here. Um, then once you've done that, you've got to go inside and mill out the breech uh, chamber, again, to an extremely high precision. Then you've got to heat and temper the gun barrel. Then you've got to wire wind the thing. Then you've got to get the barrel liner in, which may be done during the tempering process. We may do it separately, but in some way, shape or form, you've got to get the hardened gun, the actual barrel itself inside the bigger barrel. Um, as then I said, you wire wind it. Then you're putting um, another tube of steel which has to go through the exact same kind of precision long arduous precision making uh, process to get it set up in the first place then fit it on then you've got to start cutting the rifling in the barrel and that takes a long time because of course you're cutting some very 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 hard steel you have to cut it precisely to pattern and as I mentioned in previous videos, once you start, you can't stop because with the machinery that's available at that point, if you stop, no matter how much you try and restart the process exactly where you left off, there will be some slight discontinuity, which will inevitably screw up the shells as they get fired. So, you know, that very slow, very painstaking process, then you've got to fit the breech, um, get all the breech mechanisms installed. That's a relatively speaking an easy thing. And then you've also got to proof test fire the thing. And now you've got to do it another six, eight, nine or 12 times just to have the enough guns for the initial fit out, plus all the extras that you're going to be needing around for replacements. So that's why it can take years from start to finish. Togfather asks, you've spoken in the past about Admiral Sturdy's proposal for dividing the Grand Fleet in the event of a fleet action with the High Seas Fleet, and the effect this could have had at Jutland, with two or three divisions of battleships under Sturdy being on Shear's flank after his battle turnaway, with Jellicoe then in a position to follow Shear around and catch the German battleships in a crossfire. As, as I understand it, when the survivors of the Battlecruiser Fleet and 5th Battle Squadron met up with the Grand Fleet, they formed up at the rear of the line as it was heading away from them at that point. 
If Sturdy's plan had been put into action, which branch of the fleet would BT's ships had gone have gone to, and what would the effect have been? Also, if BT had joined Sturdy's force, who would have had seniority, Sturdy or BT? Well, at the time the Grand Fleet started to deploy from column into line, which would be when the formations would split under Sturdy's plan, you have the slight problem that BT has essentially abandoned 5th Battle Squadron and is striking out across the face of the Grand Fleet, which also didn't earn him much popularity points. Um, this is shortly after when the Grand Fleet has actually deployed into uh, its battle line formation and then a little bit there shortly thereafter. You can see 5th Battle Squadron led by Barham is still making its way towards the stern of the Grand Fleet, whereas over there on the right, um, BT is happily obscuring the fire lines for 1st Division led by HMS King George V over on the lead of the formation. So if the order to split had come instead of deploying into line then it's i mean fifth would definitely fifth battle squadron would definitely be over on the left hand side um or, or well left hand side from our perspective looking north from the royal navy's perspective of the right hand flank going with sturdy bt at the point the the line deploys is making a headlong way towards what would be Jellicoe's half of the fleet, but he is still close enough that he could be ordered to loop back around to join up with Sturdy. But I I have a feeling that Sturdy would probably rather have um, the remaining bat ships of Fifth Battle Squadron than have to deal with uh, BT charging around and. By the time they're all deployed, given that first scouting group is also heading east, it would make more sense for BT to be with Jellico. But as for who would have the superior rank if BT joined Sturdy's formation, that would be Sturdy. Um, Sturdy was promoted to full vice admiral in December 1913, so um, a little bit under a year before the war started, and. Uh, BT was only, well, he was acting Vice Admiral in February 1915, so a year and a quarter after Sturdy, and he was only actually confirmed to that rank in August 1915, which would be almost a year and three quarters after Sturdy. So had BT joined up with Sturdy's formation, he would definitely have been, um, he would have to have submitted to Sturdy as the superior officer. Christopher Dooley asks, between illness, combat attrition and the taking of prizes, a particularly aggressive frigate captain in the age of sail may find himself down a considerable number of crew without the prospect of immediate replacement. How much of the nominal crew could a large sailing warship afford to lose before combat effectiveness suffered? And how did crew replenishment work, if there was such a thing, for lone ships on remote stations? Crew replenishment as such, depending on exactly what skills you needed and what kind of crew you needed, could be done by recruiting some locals, if you could find some locals who are willing to sign up and knew how to sail. Um, you could potentially recruit, dash, depending on the Navy in question and the seriousness of the situation, possibly even impress people off of merchant ships. Um, you could ask for volunteers from the crews of ships that you'd captured, um, particularly, again, merchant ships, as a lot of merchant ship crews were at least somewhat multinational. And let's face it, there were always a few people who might not fancy actually fighting on the side of the country they're ostensibly from. Bear in mind, there was a reasonable Spanish and French contingent in serving in the Royal Navy quite happily against the Franco-Spanish alliance in the Age of Sail, particularly in the Napoleonic Wars. Or, if you were lucky, you might run into a formation or, or just a lone ship of the line of your own side where you might be able to beg or borrow some crewmen because a ship of the line with six, 800 crew can probably afford to lose 10 or 20 which to help out a frigate which has a much smaller crew complement. A typical you know fifth rate frigate might have 250 odd crew give or take a little bit so the effect of getting 20 new crew is you know eight nine percent increase in crew numbers for 
the frigate, but it's only a 2 or 3% decrease in crew numbers for the ship of the line. Now, of the crew, how many can you afford to lose? Well, obviously there are some key positions like a ship's surgeon that would be very difficult to replace if you just lose the ship's surgeon or ship's doctor. But in terms of the general crew, the majority of the crew are there to fight the guns. And as I've mentioned before, both in this episode and in others, the gun crews were specifically overstaffed to allow for casualties and also, at least initially when they hadn't suffered many, if any, casualties to allow them to fight both sides of the ship at once. So you could probably afford, assuming it's just random attrition from the general crew, whether that be through, as you said, illness, combat losses, or having to be sent off as prize crew, you could probably afford, on let's say a frigate with 250 to 280 men, to lose a about 60 to 80 men and you'd still be able to fight the ship relatively efficiently if you lose much more than that then you're going to start having issues of whether or not you can man all the guns and whether or not you have enough experienced sailors aloft to keep the sails in the in the layout that you want them for any given situation richard goss asks Given the Royal Navy's desire for 70 cruisers and typical government penny-pinching, do you think that the later 1900s onwards era armoured cruisers could have been retained as second-line units such as convoy escorts and showing the flagships? Wouldn't you get much modernisation, just newer fire control and maybe anti-aircraft guns? I don't think it would have been a particularly brilliant idea, unfortunately, because the ships in question are quite big and manpower-intensive, so, I mean, for the the last generation, the sort of, I guess, the 9.2 inch armed and, well, let's say the Duke of Edinburgh's Warriors and Minotaurs. So they've got varying varieties of 9.2, 7.5 and 6 inch guns they're, and they're the latest ones. So the Duke of Edinburgh's about 12,600 tons, the Warriors about 12,600 tons, the Minotaurs 14,600 tons and crew complement wise, Minotaurs about 800 Warriors about 790, Duke of Edinburgh is about 770. Now compare that with the cruisers that the Royal Navy was using for these kind of long distance convoy uh, overseas protection roles in the interwar period. The new build Leanders are 570, the Arith users only 500, the old C class is about 320, 350, the D class is about 450. So you're talking about a serious amount of manpower, you know, possibly even enough to man two of the smaller cruisers, maybe with a few left over for some of these bigger cruisers. Additionally, um, all of these older ships are triple expansion steam engines, so you'd have to refit them to turbines, which is going to be costly. And you are going to have to do some sort of modernization. I mean, OK, you can get the fire control systems on them. But there's not a lot of space, remarkably, for a ship that size left over because they're absolutely covered in 9.2 and, in the case of the Minotaurs um, and the Warriors, 7.5-inch guns. So if you need to put anti-aircraft systems on, well, you're going to have to make a choice. And I think probably what you're going to end up doing is stripping off, if you were going to do this, you would have to strip off the wing turrets and put a bunch of secondary and anti-air guns down the sides whilst retaining the fore and afts at which point it's probably not even worth you know even if you were going to do this you pretty much only want to do this with the minotaurs because then at least you've got the four 9.2 inch guns for commerce protection at either end and then a fairly large deck space amidships for secondary guns and anti-aircraft guns but the, the it's going to cost a lot to convert them this way and there's going to be very high running costs for them. So, yeah, it, unfortunately, it's just a bit too impractical for when you need sheer volume of hulls. Synchroscore asks, I was reading about the US Navy's service squadrons in the Pacific War, and I came across a mention of USS ABSD-2, Captain Joseph Roquefort, commanding. Surely I thought this couldn't be the same Joseph Roquefort whose cryptanalysis section set the stage for the Battle of Midway, could it? I kept reading and found he had indeed been plucked from his posting at Pearl Harbor and put in command of a floating dry dock. Apparently, in his unorthodox personal habits and making OP-20G back in Washington look bad by proving them wrong, he had incurred the wrath of one 
Ernest J. King. King even blocked Nimitz's recommendations of a Navy Distinguished Service Medal, which was only awarded, along with the Presidential Medal of Freedom, a decade after Roquefort died. So do you have any other amusing or interesting stories of an officer who was reassigned, demoted, or otherwise snubbed, not because of incompetence or misbehaviour, but born out of personal animus from a superior officer? Whilst I'm sure many of those who watch the channel who have served in the Navy um, or are serving in the Navy can probably relate many examples of uh, more recent instances where someone has managed to annoy the wrong officer and their career has suffered as a result, uh, there are obviously also plenty of examples of this in history but i think one of the best or worst depending on which way you want to look at it overarching examples would be admiral percy scott as shown here now those of you who are familiar with naval history will know that admiral scott is known amongst other things for being an one of the leading lights if not the leading light in the advancement of gunnery in the royal navy everything from you know range finding to director firing a lot of which he actually invented or helped to invent now the reason why i pick him as a specific example is because his entire career in large part was annoying the wrong people in the high pla in higher places and therefore getting his career held back so for reference scott entered the navy six years before john jellicoe and both of them would be favourites of Admiral Fisher later on in their careers. But by the time you get round to the 1900s, Scott is promoted to Rear Admiral in 1905, and Jellicoe is promoted to Rear Admiral right at the beginning of 1907. So despite the fact that Scott has four years seniority in terms of service time, his promotion to Rear Admiral is only two years, approximately speaking, ahead of that of Jellicoe. And you know, Jellicoe's got a reasonably decent career track. Now, you might think, oh, four years, that doesn't sound too much in terms of careers that span 50 or so years, but it is actually quite a bit. Because one, remember, when you're being promoted to Admiral, especially back then, you're usually somewhat older, which means that your remaining service in the Navy, i.e. your service at flag rank, is going to be probably significantly shorter but also in terms of command tours and experience for what was typically an admiral's command position in the navy at that stage you're basically talking about scott having been held back about two full command cycles which is uh, yeah that's quite a mark on his career and the, the strange thing about scott and the indictment i guess on some of the people he managed to annoy higher up is that Scott wasn't one of these people who turned around and said, well, I think this is wrong, you should do something about it. At which point you could probably understand that, you know, that kind of unhelpfulness is probably going to be punished. Scott was the kind of person who would say, this is wrong, or this isn't useful, or this doesn't work properly. And usually he then went off and actually invented something or modified something so that it did actually work, i.e. he solved the problem. And then his communication with his superior officers was, hey, I found this problem. Also, here is the solution. Why don't we do this instead? And sometimes, very rarely, his suggestion was adopted. Other times, a little bit more commonly, they would take his suggestion. Then people would try to modify it so that they could put their little stamp and say, oh, look, I had a part in this. Usually ruin it, waste loads of money and probably several years trying to make their revised version work and then go back to using his version anyway or the most common occurrence they just ignored it and let the situation fester so clearly some people didn't like the advances that he was bringing about goose Riesbos asks vt fuses were famously used by allied aa gunners and later by allied artillery to create airburst shells my question, did anyone ever try to see if it was possible to put one in a coastal bombardment shell for a battleship, or was this seen as overkill? Although a radar proximity fuse would eventually be introduced into high-capacity shells um, from very large guns for bombardment, during the bulk, if not the entirety, of World War II, it generally wasn't done for three reasons. Firstly, 
Allied planners and strategists were paranoid about the idea of the VT fuse falling into enemy hands. So if you were chucking VT fuse shells up into the sky in the middle of the ocean, that wasn't so much of a concern because it would be obviously around your fleet and in the event of a dud, and there are always going to be duds when you mass produce things in these kinds of numbers, then the dud shell just fall into the sea and sink and nobody would be any the wiser. So happy days. However, if you ended up with a dud in a shell that then crashed ashore in enemy held positions, it was entirely possible that the enemy might recover that at shell, discover the fuse, and then redo it so they had their own version. Um, which, you know, that got to the extent that, you know, at various points in the war, VT fuses weren't even allowed to be used near certain sections of the front line because they were so paranoid about this. So that's one one issue. The second issue is that whilst the VT fuse is obviously a radar proximity fuse, it goes under the codename VT variable time fuse. There were actual variable time fuses, things that, things that had been used on heavy caliber anti-aircraft shells before the VT fuse was introduced and also continued to be used to a certain extent afterwards. And unlike targeting a fast-moving aircraft or targeting a ship, since the coastline, whatever it is you happen to be shooting at, bunker, beach, trench, shore gun, etc., they don't tend to move very much. So the time of flight from ship to, to shore but for the shell was much, much more reliable and easily calculated than it would be for something in a constantly changing environment. And therefore, just using the old mechanically timed fuses was an entirely workable solution to get a battleship high capacity or HE shell to explode above a target. And then finally, there's the fact that if you're using 14, 15 or 16 inch battleship guns to bombard an enemy coast, Yes, having a giant airburst shell might have certain amenity to it, but with the relatively limited number of heavy guns available, you tend to be using those heavy guns for things that those heavy guns are the only things capable of doing. So, you know, blowing up an entire bunker or causing a massive crater, that kind of thing. And for those roles, you don't want the shell detonating 40, 50 foot above the target. You want it to actually hit ideally embed itself and then explode so yeah battleship shells with vt fuses is possible but there's a long list of reasons why during the bulk of world war ii it doesn't happen if the gods wanted us to be happy they would have given us a honey-based alcoholic beverage oh look mead asks can you tell us of thomas cochran at, th at the point of his career where he was captain of the brig hms speedy and his capture of the spanish frigate el gamo yeah, well, I think we've spoken about the capture of El Gamo before, but it's probably worth mentioning again. So Cochrane, well, at least this particular Cochrane, there was more than one Admiral Cochrane in the Royal Navy. He is basically Leroy Jenkins with a tricorn hat. Uh, that is pretty much his entire career. His favourite target, um, unlike many British officers at the time, was actually the Spanish. He seems to have held a particularly, particular degree of animosity for them that most... British commanders at the time held for the French but nonetheless at this particular time he was in command of the brig HMS Speedy uh, armed notionally with 14 guns nothing much heavier than a four pounder and his crew had been reduced due to his earlier success in capturing various prizes he then comes across the Spanish Zebec frigate so slightly smaller than your average frigate El Gamo which still massively outguns and massively outnumbers him in terms of crew now for a frigate with over 30 guns, El Gamo was relatively lightly armed. None of her guns are 18-pounders. Well, she's got a couple of heavy carronades, but her main battery is 12-pounders, which it would be marginal for a, the average sixth-rate frigate. She's very lightly armed for a fifth-rate, but as I said, she's a Zebec frigate, so she's considerably smaller and more lightly built than your average fifth-rate. But, as I said, still massively a superior vessel to the Speedy. Of course, both sides are suspicious of each other, and El Gamo closes in on Speedy, hoists her Spanish colours, and opens fire. Well, she fires a warning shot. Cochrane first flies American colours, which is a valid ruse of war, because he hasn't shot back yet. The Spanish hesitate for a moment, 
because they're not at war with the USA, so they shouldn't fire on an American vessel, but they are still suspicious. And Cochrane realises that in a straight-up gun duel, he is going to lose. And so he uses that moment of hesitation to get his ship closer to the Spanish, and then switches his colours up for the Royal Navy, the British colours, and opens fire. But as you can probably see from this picture or engraving, what he's actually done is he's manoeuvred his ship so close, and it's so small, that the Spanish main battery can fire all it likes, but it's never going to hit him or his crew. All it's going to do is cut up the rigging and the sails, which if it goes on for a while will be a bit of a problem, but uh, he's not planning on the fight lasting all that long. So once he's effectively right alongside he can obviously elevate his guns to fire up through the spanish ship the spanish ship however can't depress its guns far enough to shoot at him so he's merrily blazing away at the spanish the spanish realize okay this is a bit of a dumb thing but we have such a superiority in numbers we can just board speedy and take it over of course that means calling most of the gun crews up to help in the boarding action because there's relatively few deck crew specifically on deck and you know the marine contingent if any on a ship this size is not going to be very large at which point Cochrane realizes well if they board us we're doomed sheer weight of numbers so he pulls away because most of the gunners have left their post to become part of the boarding crew so he's not at risk of being fired at by the main battery and all the Spanish men are assembled up on the upper deck ready to board the ship and thus make easy targets for Speedy's gunnery it doesn't take the Spanish very long to realise what's going on, and or they order their men to disperse, go back to the guns, and fire at Speedy. And whilst they're doing that, Cochrane swings his ship back in again, and you're back at to square one. This goes back and forth several times until eventually Cochrane realises that they're probably going to figure out his trick sooner or later, and also any, all the ongoing fire is really tearing up his mass and rigging. So there's a question as to whether or not Speedy will actually be able to manoeuvre for very much longer. And so he decides to basically do a pincer movement, but with inferior numbers. So he takes his crew, splits them into two, sends one of them, uh, one of the boarding parties boarding at the bow, the other boards roughly amidships, and there's one very surprised and rather amused ship's doctor who's the only man left aboard Speedy <laughs> because everyone else is in the boarding party, still horribly outnumbered, but of course... To the Spanish sense is, why would you split a boarding party in two and attack from two different directions if you're already outnumbered? You know, that's insanity. That assures defeat in detail. So they're not particularly confident as to what exactly is going on here. There's a big fight up on deck because the Spanish gunners have recently, after the third attempt, gone back down to their gun deck again. Um, they're not available to completely overwhelm the boarders just at the minute. And... Cochrane manages to conduct a ruse. He yells over the side, oh, send up the next wave of men. The, as I said, there's only actually one man down there. The Spanish don't know this, however. And uh, then the boarding party that's boarded further back manages to pull down the Spanish colours, at which point most of the men who are fighting think, ah, oh, right, the officers, who are the ones who should be on the poop deck, have struck the colours, therefore we'll surrender. By the time they've realised what's going on, they have actually surrendered. And the British have control of the ship's upper decks, which means they control the ship. And they can tell everyone, hey, you're, you're now prize, a prize of Her Majesty's, or His Majesty's at that point, Navy. Um, so, yeah, <laughs> that's how you capture a much, much larger ship than you, using a combination of very clever tactics and also blatant lies. Anton Alert asks, Kirk and Dr. McCoy, Picard and Dr. Crusher, Aubrey and Dr. Maturin, in naval and science fiction... Ship's captains and their ship's doctor have a close relationship. Is this purely fictional, or were doctors part of the command crew in the time that the channel covers? It's certainly not fiction, but it is based very much in the age of sail. I mean, obviously there is still something of a distinction between the general enlisted crew and the ship's officer corps in modern navies, but back in the age of sail it was even more pronounced because there were a lot more social divides as well as just hierarchical and rank divides. But nonetheless, a ship's captain, if he was on an age of sail warship, might be at sea for months if not years at a time, and that could be a rather lonely position because for 
hierarchical command and so and social reasons, he couldn't be seen to fraternise or be particularly familiar with the general men under his command, the sailors. But whilst it was socially acceptable for him to dine with, etc., etc., the rest of the ship's officers, they were still his subordinates, so there would always be a certain degree of decorum to be maintained, and certain topics would obviously therefore not be able to be discussed. However, the ship's doctor or ship's surgeon or ship's physician, whatever you want to call him, whatever his rank happened to be, because he was a professional, he was allowed to dine with the officers, part of the ship's wardroom. He was basically in the officer cadre from a social perspective, and therefore it was acceptable to hang around and chat with him. But because he was not a commissioned officer, usually, um, there were some very, very rare cases where you would have a commissioned officer in a navy who also happened to have doctor skills. But normally, at least again in the age of sail, the ship's doctor would not hold an official ra commissioned rank within the ship's command hierarchy. And therefore, the strictures about discussing certain matters with a fellow officer didn't apply. So the captain basically had this rather relatively unique opportunity to talk to someone who would presumably have a similar interest to him or at least have a similar level of knowledge about the things that a gentleman was supposed to know about and discuss, but also he didn't have any of the hindrances that would come from, oh yes, well I can't really discuss that I don't like the ship's you know, this particular midshipman or, you know, the the second lieutenant, I'm not particularly fond of him. You can't really say that to the first officer or another midshipman. Um, and because the captain is supposed to be the ultimate authority, you also even can't say things to the rest of your officers like, you know, I'm actually having a really tough week so far. Um, but to the ship's doctor, as long as you had a good enough personal friendship, you could say that. And so it was kind of a bit of a stress relief dash therapy for the ship's captain. And thus, usually you end up with a fairly close relationship. And because they realize this, you know, ship captains aren't usually dumb. Quite often, the ship's captain or commanding officer, if they're not a captain strictly by rank, would often go and persuade specific doctors to come aboard and serve aboard their ships people they already knew, people they already thought they would get on with, to kind of build on that capability. Todd Webb asks, King Alexander of Yugoslavia was apparently interested in purchasing battleships from France when he was assassinated during his official visit to Marseille. I'm not sure if there's any records of what type they wanted, or whether they would be Dunkirk, Richelieu, class, etc, etc, but what do you suspect? Also, do you think when the Germans came by land to, the, to Yugoslavia, would they have sailed for Alexandria to be in the Free Yugoslavian Navy or surrendered? Given the timing of his death in the early 1930s, and given the designs of battleships that the French were designing and building at that time, the Richelieu's are out of the question. They're far too far ahead of time. Also, obviously, they're considerably larger and much more expensive. Therefore, a nation like Yugoslavia, with relatively limited finances, isn't really going to be in a position to purchase them, even if they wanted to. So I would suspect that if he was interested in purchasing battleships around about 1934 they're probably going to be either Dunkirk class or derivations on the Dunkirk class. So displacing significantly less than the treaty limits say, but still being relatively well armed and relatively quick. Now, as far as what happens to them in the Second World War, if they were built in and entered service in the Yugoslavian Navy, it's a little bit of a coin toss because there are three primary fates for Yugoslavian Navy ships historically in World War II that we can draw on. Firstly, they came under relatively heavy air attack, and that's for a fleet that consists primarily of destroyers and smaller vessels. If that fleet has full-blown battleships, you can guarantee they'd be targeted even more heavily. I mean, the Greeks had a pair of obsolete pre-dreadnoughts, and they still went after them. So 
first possibility, they may be hit and sunk in harbour. But they might manage to avoid that fate. Second fate, captured. Um, a good chunk of the Yugoslavian navy was captured, mostly by the Italians, as a result of the relatively swift campaign and geographic location. So it's possible that they might end up under Italian flag service the same way that some of the Yugoslavian navy historically was, albeit that other Yugoslavian navy vessels that were at threat of capture were scuttled instead of allowing themselves to be captured, so maybe that's a, you know, a part B to that option. But then lastly, a number of Yugoslavian ships did escape and make their way down to the uh, Mediterranean theatre where they joined up with the rest of the Allies. So it would be entirely possible and, you know, within the realms of historical plausibility that they might sail and join up with Admiral Cunningham's forces. Now, of those three, I mean, it could go any of those ways. A lot of it's going to depend on how successful Italian and German airstrikes on them are. But assuming that they survive, I would rather suspect they'd be more likely than not to make it to... Alexandria rather than being captured in place because it would be fairly clear what the risks of the, it would be inherent in you know, strengthening your enemies would be so if they were in any way shape or form serviceable I suspect as soon as the invasion starts they would be deployed also if you have let's say two Dunkirk class battleships whether they're built to Dunkirk or Strasbourg class specifications that's a force that you can deploy and potentially ruin the day of enemy naval forces, as opposed to the existing, you know, original timeline Yugoslavian Navy, which, with the best will in the world, wasn't really in a position to challenge any major Regia Marina force. This time you can, so they'd probably be at sea, and when the situation looks like it's getting bad, that would put them in a better position, albeit having to run a gauntlet of air attacks again, to try and get out to freedom. Lord Quack, King of Ducks, asks, Looking at the recent sailing of HMS Queen Elizabeth, it was widely reported that part of its aircraft complement was made up of US Marine Corps F-35s. Aside from USS Robin-HMS Victorious, during World War II, did this sort of thing happen, where one nation's pilots made up a significant amount of the combat strength of another nation's carrier? Presumably it really only applies to US-UK carriers? It's not really a common thing, because there there, there are... A quite a few interoperational issues that you have to overcome obviously as you mentioned when hms victorious aka uss robin was serving alongside saratoga there was a considerable exchange of pilots and planes while they were working out how to learn best from each other but outside of that it's very very rare now there was quite a a pilot exchange so there's naval observers on various ships but also between the u.s navy and the royal navy you will find fleet air arm pilots occasionally serving aboard u.s carriers and u.s pilots serving aboard british carriers but they won't be part of their own native squadrons they'll be part of a squadron that is you know if it's uh, aboard a royal navy carrier it'll be a fleet air arm squadron if it's aboard a u.s carrier it'll be a u.s navy or u.s marine corps squadron um but in terms of whole unit exchanges, um, not really, generally speaking. However, you do get a few odd instances, uh, such as, for example, there are a couple of escort carriers, which are primarily crewed by Canadians, but because Canada at that point didn't have its equivalent of the FAA, the air group on what was, for all intents and purposes at that stage, a Canadian carrier was still fleet air arm so i guess you could call that british british pilots and british squadrons operating off of a canadian aircraft carrier smoky the bear asks the u.s was slow to understand capabilities of japanese torpedoes like the long lance captain rooks of uss houston ca30 made a report on this matter i've heard how was this sent did it return with marblehead or boise before the loss of houston and why wasn't it believed for so long, especially in light of U.S. experience in the Solomon Islands and uh, in the aftermath of the Jav Java Sea battles? So reports could be transmitted home by a number of methods. 
if they were relatively short or if the radio operators and telegram telegraph operators had nothing better to do you could transmit a report of any length back home it would just take a while but if the report was a relatively short one then that would be one way of, of getting it back obviously this would usually be done by a land-based station if you wanted to send a physical typed up report back which could obviously be quite extensive then that would be usually drafted up by the uh, ship's captain and and or his secretary if he had one but in any case once it was produced then normally that would be then put ashore as soon as the ship got to uh, a, the first reasonable port and then that would travel back via military mail and that could be sent back with a ship that was known to be going back immediately it could be sent back by air aircraft which was quite often the case because obviously let's say where houston is operating in the far western reaches of the pacific if you put that ashore then an aircraft could say take that back to australia and from australia that could then be sent partly by ship or partly by aircraft or wholly by aircraft perhaps staging to pearl harbor and then staging back across the ocean or if it's a less urgent report it might be taken home by a given ship so and you might also have a, a pricey version of a report that will be transmitted directly and more immediately with the longer version to follow and of course at the various stages in the command hierarchy you would have copies of the report delivered it also depends where the report's being delivered to so uh, you know it may be a report from a ship's captain to the admiral in charge of his unit or his fleet so that would be a relatively short transition point that just needs to get to a shore station or a flagship and then if the admiral decides i'm going to pass this further on up the line then that may be just passed on wholesale or it may be passed on as part of one of the admiral's reports which introduces a bit of time delay between the two but can also therefore be transmitted by the various methods we just discussed so for exactly how high up the food chain and the method by which it got there captain rooks's report got i don't know precisely um immediately but why wasn't it believed for so long well as i've covered in various other videos both from a general intelligence perspective u.s military intelligence had failed to predict and or anticipate a lot of japanese capabilities and that was coupled with again as i mentioned before a relatively racist attitude pre-war which carried on for a little bit of time during the war where both for institutional reasons as well as racial reasons people just couldn't bring themselves to believe that the Japanese could have equal let alone superior capabilities to the capabilities of their own forces in this case the US Navy and that in turn led led to confirmation bias so when you're presented with a situation of hey we're getting hit by torpedoes at considerably longer ranges than torpedoes have any right to hit us you could conclude that the Japanese have built a superior long distance torpedo or there's a very small possibility that they might have snuck submarines into the engagement as well somehow now that's very Im implausible but it allows the japanese to execute this strike with torpedoes that you weren't expecting using technologies that you do expect them to have on hand submarines and regular range torpedoes and thus suddenly the confirmation bias says, oh well of course although it's very very improbable that must be the explanation because i don't like the other one fletcher fletcher's fetching fletcher fletcher fletching fetcher fetching fletcher's fletcher fletcher fletchings asks in a survivor's account of his rescue from uss indianapolis he said that when they were being rescued the watchmen on various rescuing ships kept interrogating them in the water with questions like who won the world series and the like why was this happening was there a practice of not picking up japanese survivors or was there some other reason, like some paranoia about Japanese frogmen in the middle of the open ocean? It was basically for security reasons, because obviously if you're hauling in survivors of a ship being sunk, and they are your own men, in this case from the US Navy, then you need to treat them as best you can. So straight to sick bay for those that need treatment, um, else you know, wrap them in blankets, give them something hot to drink, etc., etc., and stick them somewhere out of the way 
But if they're enemy crew, then you, well, you still, in theory, should be treating them relatively well, but you're not going to leave them unsupervised or with minimal supervision. They have to be kept under guard. And so you need to know, okay, who are actually, actually we bringing aboard and what appropriate measures do we need to take in terms of security? So this asking of people who was, who like who won the World Series in the case of the US, this was relatively standard practice across the Pacific Theatre. I don't know precisely if it happened with the Indianapolis survivors, but I do know it happened with a number of other survivors of various ships being sunk. And you might think, well, surely you can just tell a visual inspection who's American and who's Japanese. Well, there's a couple of factors. The lesser factor is there are some Japanese-American sailors serving in the U.S. Navy. Okay, not a huge amount of them, but you can see where there'd be cause for visual confusion there. Plus, as was covered in the episode on Marblehead, there are also a number of various um, Asian nationality crew aboard U.S. ships. A lot of them... Sort of Chinese or Filipino serving in places like the laundry um, and the uh, ca cafeteria cooking areas. So that, again, could cause a bit of a problem on long-range visual distinction. And to be honest, given that a bunch of the sailors in the US probably had never seen uh, large numbers of people from those regions up close before, Asking them to distinguish between is this a Chinese cook or a Japanese sailor might be a little bit of a, a difficult one for them. But the much larger issue, to be honest, is you're generally having to identify these people whilst they're still in the water, you know, to make sure that, you know, especially given the Japanese sailors, for example, to make sure that even that they don't attack the people who have thrown the nets down to them when they get up to the top of the net. So you've got a distance thing to take into account. Plus, if you're looking at a bunch of people who are probably badly sunburned, potentially covered in ship's oil, and have been exposed to salt water for hours or days, that kind of A, distinguish, disguises any skin coloration with all the oil and muck that's going to be on them. Plus, people's faces tend to swell up when subjected to ship's oil and prolonged exposure to sun and salt air and a bunch of them might be wounded or injured and so forth so if you're looking at swollen human covered in smears of oil and wreckage and sunburn you're actually going to be very diff very very hard place to figure out who's who especially at 50 to 100 feet so you ask them something that only theoretically an american would be interested in like the world baseball series and then if you get the reply then and it's a correct reply then you know it's probably americans that you're hauling in jeffrey Connolly asks aside from the original six frigates which would you say is the most famous frigate be it sail or steam in the u.s navy as i've always thought it was uss cumberland mainly due to growing up always listening to the ballad called cumberland's crew I'm actually going to say it's one that is completely, generally unknown for what it did in life, but unintentionally has become exceptionally famous due to what happened to its remains after it died, and that's USS Merrimack. Yes, I know it's a technicality, but come on, what else were you going to expect me to do? Um, no, seriously, it probably is Merrimack, because of course Merrimack was a steam frigate, of the US Navy. She was in Norfolk when the Confederacy captured the place in the American Civil War. She was burnt because she couldn't be extracted in time, but the bit of her hull that was still in the water didn't burn out completely. Her upper works and the upper hull did. And that burnt out wreck was then recovered by the Confederate Navy and used as the basis for the ironclad CSS Virginia, which of course fought against USS Monitor in the world's first engagement of ironclad versus ironclad ship. But despite the fact that she was officially retitled CSS Virginia, there are loads and loads of books, articles, encyclopedias, newspapers, headlines, etc., etc., out there that all describe the Monitor versus Merrimack fight. So if you ask somebody to name a U.S. vessel from, say, the War of Independence through to the American Civil War, uh, 
apart from monitor herself and obviously constitution being one of the original six frigates merrimack will probably be one of the first names that comes to people's minds and since that's the name of the frigate not the name of the ironclad it technically makes her a really famous frigate despite it's not actually about her time as a frigate richard show asks i recently rewatched both the 1976 and 2019 midway movies you poor, poor person. And I noticed that both films tried to portray different Japanese admirals as competent. For the 1976 film, Admiral Nagumo seemed to be portrayed as more competent, with him making several good decisions, such as initially listening to Minoru Genda and holding back a second wave on Midway, while the film tried to explain Nagumo's indecisiveness by showing him being pressured by polar suggestions from Admiral Kusaka and Minoru Genda. For the 2019 movie, it tries to portray Admiral Yamaguchi in a better light by portraying him as more forward-thinking, honourable, and more decisive. My question is, are these portrayals of these two admirals by the two Midway movies accurate? A lot of how accurately you think the portrayals of Admirals Nagumo and Yamaguchi are in those movies is going to depend a lot on how you view them in the first place. And, well, let's just say that discussions over exactly how Admiral Nagumo should be viewed are many and ongoing. So some historians will say that his portrayal in the first Midway movie is accurate, and others will say it's completely inaccurate, and there are various things in between. Personally, I am less favourable towards Admiral Nagumo than some. So, uh, I mean... I don't think he made good decisions, um, personally, both at Midway and previously. Now, obviously, that was to the benefit of the US Navy and the Royal Navy at various stages in his career, but they're still not particularly brilliant decisions. One of the main things brought up to defend his decision-making is that he stuck to Japanese Navy doctrine, which, yes, that is true. However, I would argue that if your doctrine is a dumb doctrine, then you should ele elect to ignore said doctrine and do something somewhat more effective, which is what both, you know, the, the best admirals in the US and Royal Navies did, and also what some of the better admirals, like Azawa, in the Japanese Navy did when they got the opportunity. Um, and for that matter, Admiral Yamaguchi seems to have been much more willing to break with doctrine and was obsessive about getting his men to the pinnacle of their performance. So my personal opinion is that Nagumo was far too constrained in his tactics, at least by the time of World War II, by what Japanese naval doctrine said. So if doctrine said you must do this, then he did it. If doctrine said you shouldn't do this, then he didn't do it. And he appears to have drawn a line there. So for example, during Operation C, he made certain scouting efforts which failed to locate Admiral Somerville's fleet, even though Admiral Somerville's fleet came a lot closer to the Japanese fleet than the Americans did at Midway. Now, you can defend that by saying he's launched standard Japanese Navy search pattern. Well, yes, but he's the Admiral on site. The Japanese standard Navy search pattern was awful. <laughs> so he could have identified that and done better. And similarly at Midway, Whilst he had some aircraft armed for anti-shipping and some aircraft armed for an anti-land strikes, he could, as Admiral Yamaguchi wanted to do, and this is the contrast between the two, he could have said, right, well, we're going to launch all our anti-shipping armed aircraft now, and while they're off bothering the Americans, we're going to get everybody who's armed for land strikes to rearm. That would have gotten his strikes off considerably earlier and maybe made a difference at Midway. But Japanese doctrine said, no, you must launch a big strike, and it consists of either land or naval-based munitions. And so he had to try and change things over. So I would say that Yamaguchi's portrayal is probably, from my perspective, a little bit more accurate than Nagumo's portrayal is in the circumstances that you listed. Dave Collier asks, I was reading about the air raid on Bari Harbour on 2nd of December 1943. Why was there a Lib Liberty ship, the SS John Harvey, filled with mustard gas in the European theatre at all, and especially in a harbour that was at risk of bombing by Axis forces? It's one of those quietly understated 
things from World War II, not helped by the fact that a lot of it was classified at the time and continued to be classified for quite a while afterwards. But after World War I, although everybody recognised the horror that had come about from the use of chemical weapons, everybody was both equally determined not to use them themselves, or at least not to be the first ones to use them, but were also absolutely terrified of the other side using them. That's why gas masks were issued en masse to the British population, because they were worried the Germans were going to include chemical weapons in the Blitz. But uh, also that's what brought up the planning for Operation Vegetarian, and if you ever want plenty of nightmares, go and read up on that. Um, now, when it comes to this particular vessel... What had been happening was that as the Allies were opening up new fronts, they were worried that the harder they pushed the Germans, and the Italians in this case, the more and more likely it might be that they, Germans and Italians, might break out chemical weapons as weapons of last resort to throw back the Allies. As it turned out, uh, if I remember correctly, I think Hitler was so traumatised by the use of chemical weapons on the Western Front that he wouldn't authorise their use in battle. Uh, fine using them in the Holocaust, apparently, but not against other soldiers. But that's Hitler for you. Nonetheless, because they were worried that this might happen, and because of the obvious effects that that might have on the Allied offensive, the Allies decided that they were going to maintain large stockpiles of chemical weapons behind the lines, with the intention that if the Germans turned around and used any of their own chemical weapons, the Allies would then Im be immediately able to launch a massive retaliatory strike. But if you're going to keep a large stockpile of chemical weapons behind the lines as your lines advance through Italy, that means you need to actually get them there. And one of the ways of getting them there was aboard the SS John Harvey, and hence it was stacked not actually with mustard gas, but it was stacked with mustard gas bombs, the, i.e. the bombs that you would use to drop this stuff, and a variety of different chemicals which were the precursor chemicals that you would mix to create mustard gas and then it got bombed and set on fire and exploded and a bunch of people got exposed to something that officially wasn't there so that's why she was there in the first place both in europe generally uh, to provide the stockpile and in the harbor specifically because that was the quickest and easiest way to get the chemicals to their designated um, storage locations hms inconceivable asks Follow up to the fleet destroyers being overloaded, why did so few Allied fleet destroyers carry hedgehog or squid launchers during World War II? Was it a lack of production, or was space that limited? I've noticed that Gearings received hedgehogs in their post-World War II refits, so surely it's not as if the thought never occurred to them. It's a mixture of factors. Firstly, both hedgehog and squid are, well, they're not as weighty as a for 4.5, 4.7 or 5 inch gun mounting or gun turret but they're still relatively weighty things and they require installation relatively high up in the ship so stability and weight is a problem plus deck space is probably the single largest so if you've ever been on a museum ship uh, destroyer or you've seen one of the videos like the one on Hyder the thing is, even for the Hedgehog, which is the smaller and less impactful of the two launchers compared to Squid, where on a fleet destroyer would you put it? You don't really want to put it on the same deck as the lower of the two, what's usually going to be two forward gun mountings, because it uses an electrical firing system, and as the Allies found out very quickly, if it gets wet, it can cause a lot of problems. You'd want to mount it higher up, but... In the higher up mounting positions where you'd usually find the super firing gun or guns there's actually very very little space to put it and if you start putting it behind the bridge you obviate the whole forward firing ahead portion of the weapon so there's weight issues there's space issues there's then lastly production issues the, the bottlenecks now you these were relatively swiftly manufacturable but when you consider that even if you make hundreds upon hundreds of them, there are hundreds upon hundreds of corvettes, frigates, destroyer escorts, etc., all of which need one or more hedgehog launchers, plus ones that are getting damaged need replacement, plus once they've fired their rounds, the new rounds you're making need to go to reload them, and the escort vessels that possess these things, 
are going to be using them considerably more because they're usually off escorting convoys, which is what is the most likely thing to get attacked by a submarine, as opposed to relatively fast-moving naval formations, which, whilst they can also be subject to submarine attack, are statistically less likely to be attacked by subs, at which point you would tend to prioritise the smaller escort vessels for hedgehog and squid launchers than you would these larger vessels, which as in any case may need to sacrifice some of their more general offensive weaponry to fit the things. That's not to say it's not done at all, but it's a matter of just priorities. Plus, as you move further into the war and the submarine threat begins to be contained, then you start to see various escort-type units, whether that be, as I said, frigates, destroyer escorts, or whatever, assigned to main fleet units that's why tabara which again is a destroyer escort for example is with task force 38 when typhoon cobra hits so if you're still producing these escort vessels and the escort vessels are the best anti-submarine hunters and they've now got their hedgehog units and they're with the fleet there's even less pressure to start sacrificing weight and deck space on fleet destroyers which could be used for other things bearing in mind that the fleet destroyers need significant anti-aircraft armament because air attack on forward deployed military formations is considerably more likely than submarine attack is to them and obviously as we just said the submarine attack is more likely on the merchant convoys so if you've got a choice of well we can have a destroyer escort over there that's got a couple of hedgehog launchers and my fletcher or tribal or whatever has lots of 20 mil 40 mil and the dual purpose main guns or we can take off a twin bofors or one of my main deck guns in exchange for a hedgehog launcher on a fleet destroyer they're probably going to keep the aa guns once you get into a post-war environment you have newer and larger destroyers coming out and the anti-air role switches away from the world war ii build destroyers and as the world war ii build destroyers generally trend towards the anti-submarine role that's why in post-world war ii refits they tend to pick up anti-submarine launchers like hedgehog or squid